So when we're talking about the angels, the Prophet ﷺ was asked particularly on the night of Al Isra wal Mi'raj. You know, there were some people that questioned that journey, how he made that journey. There are some people that just wanted to know what it was like. And a group of companions came to the Prophet ﷺ and they asked the Messenger وسلم, <clears throat> what did it sound like? You know, what did you see and what did it sound like? I mean, as you're traveling through these galaxies with rapid speed, what is it that you heard out there? And the Messenger وسلم, <clears throat> he says, Inni ara ma la taron. He says, look, I see things that you are incapable of seeing. And I hear things that you are incapable of hearing. He says, Inna samaa attat. Said the heavens are creaking. Attat means they are shaking violently. And there's a reason why the sound of it is like it's shaking violently. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, because there isn't a space of four fingers except that there is an angel that, is, that has been created in prostration to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is doing nothing but declaring his praises. So he described the sound of vibration. Okay, I want you just to listen quickly to what it sounds like in outer space. NASA actually had a recording from outer, outer space they put up 16 years ago, right before the turn of the millennium. And the name of the research was, Our Universe is Not Silence. Because there was this idea that if you went out to outer space, you wouldn't hear anything except for the moving objects. Just listen to what it sounds like in outer space. Obviously, you know, that's good enough. You guys can't hear everything. Um, but if you get a chance to listen to it, it's actually quite breathtaking. And actually one of the researchers who published that research said that it sounds like a billion men doing Gregorian chants all simultaneously at the same time. SubhanAllah. When I heard that, I remember this hadith of the Messenger SallAllahu Alaihi Wasallam. Inni ara ma la taron wa asma'u ma la tasma'un. Look, I see things that you don't see and I hear things that you don't hear. And that's a sign of hope for us as well because we're always paranoid about jinn being everywhere and shayateen being everywhere. The number of angels compared to the number of jinn is dramatically different. There's a huge difference between how many angels there are, are out there and how many jinn and devils there are out there. So this is a magnificent creation, the malaika. They, you know, belief in them is the second pillar of our faith. And subhanAllah, Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, he says the reason why it's the second pillar of our faith is because of Jibreel alayhi salam. Because the only reason, for example, we don't necessarily have, well, we have to believe in the jinn, but it's not necessarily a pillar of faith, right? Can you be a believer without believing in the jinn? No, you can't. It's in the Quran, Surah Al-Jinn. But it's not a separate category of the pillars of faith. The reason being that all of the pillars of faith have to do with the integrity of the message. And so the reason why a pillar of faith, there's a separate pillar of faith of belief in the Malaika is because of this angel Jibreel alayhi salam that brings the message to the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So it clarifies the integrity of the Messenger to the Messenger which helps us fully appreciate this message as well. And obviously, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us many things about these angels. And the thing is, is that it's in every culture and every theology, you have some form of belief in the angels, right? In Judeo-Christian thought, you have a belief in, in the angels as being a, a, cre a creation that, you know, can make mistakes. They've been reduced to fallibility. They can fall. So you have a concept of dark angels, Lucifer, the devil. And in fact, they don't actually separately believe in a category of jinn. They're simply demons and dark angels. So they do have that category. They do have that belief. And within Christianity, you'll find many different beliefs about who the specific angels are and what their roles are. So for example, in Mormonism, Gabriel is Nuh He's actually Noah, right? So you'll find different beliefs as to who they are within Christianity and within Judaism. You'll find that uh, in, Ju in Judeo-Christian thought as well, the angels are created from fire. Whereas the Prophet ﷺ told us they're created from what? From light. And that excludes all forms of impurity. And as Suyuti rahimahullah says, Allah chose to create them from the most beautiful creation, which is light, 
Because that is, the, that is what he chose to create his hijab from, his veil. As the Prophet ﷺ said, Allah speaks from behind a veil of light. So it's the most beautiful creation and it excludes all forms of impurity. And it's a testimony to their infallibility. Now, do they have physical presences as well? Do they have a physical presence or are they just light? Right? They do have a physical presence. And they have a, a pretty dominating physical presence. Right? And you know, a lot of times when you see portrayals of angels, because again, you'll find them even in, in, in the thought of Confucius, there's a belief in angels. Even the pagans of Mecca believed in angels, but they called them what? Banatul Rahman, the daughters of the most merciful. So if you looked up a Wikipedia entry of Gabriel, for example, and you saw the portrayal, right, and you see the portrayal of most angels in, in, you know, in drawings and in sculpture, you'll find that they look like babies in diapers, right? They're very weak, small creatures, right? Whereas the portrayal that we find in our religion is that this is a strong creation, a huge creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that do as they are commanded, that exclude all forms of fault, all forms of flaw, all forms of impurity. Just as we testify that the messengers of God, all of them, Abraham, Noah, Jesus, Moses, David, peace be upon them all, just as we testify that they are all infallible and that they do not commit those, those mistakes, the angels as well are completely infallible and do not disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with anything that's been given to them. As Allah tells us in the Quran, لا يعصون الله ما أمرهم ويفعلون ما يؤمنون That they do not disobey a single command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they do exactly as they are told. However, do they love certain things? Do they hate certain things? Do they have characters? Yes, they do. They're not robots, right? So you'll find numerous narrations which talk about what offends the angels and what causes them to come near. Arguments or, or debates amongst the angels, the angels of mercy and the angels of punishment. And Jibreel alayhi salam as well, having a character. Now what do they look like? All right, Allah tells us they do have wings, not those two little weak uh, feathery wings that you see. They do have wings. Uli ajniha, mathna wa thulatha wa ruba'a. Some of them have two wings. Some of them have three wings, some of them have four wings. Yazidu fil khalqi ma yasha. And Allah increases them as He wills. Now, that automatically tells us that they're of different sizes. But what would an average angel look like? Just an average malak. All right? To give you an idea of just an average angel, uh, Safwan ibn Sulaym radiallahu ta'ala anhu he narrates that ma salla ahad, no one enters into his salah. This is just you praying in your room thinking that no one's around you, thinking that you're all alone. Except that there are angels the size of mountains that are praying there with you. You think you're in your room all by yourself. You've got angels, creatures the size of mountains that are there praying with you, that are there glorifying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with you. All right, what about an angel that has a bigger task then? An angel that, that, you know, that belongs to a more elite group of angels. How about Hamalat al Arsh, the bearers of the throne, right? We mentioned them in our supplications. Allahumma inni asbahtu ushiduk wa ushidu Hamalat al Arshik. You know, we, we call them to bear witness at times. Allah praises this group of angels. What do they look like? The Prophet wasallam, he says, I've been given permission to tell you about just one of those angels, one of the angels who bears the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, إِنَّمَا بَيْنَ الشَّحْمَةِ أُذُنِهِ إِلَىٰ عَاتِقِهِ مَسِيرَةُ سَبْعِمِئَةِ عَامٍ He said, the distance between his earlobe and his shoulder is a journey of 700 years. That's just from here to here. And the narration of Ibn Khuzaymah, the Prophet ﷺ said, a bird could fly that journey in 700 years. So it's not just you walking and taking breaks. If a bird just was flying continuously for 700 years, he'd only make it from here to here on one of those angels. So how do we even determine who's a bigger angel and who's a smaller angel? And what does this have to do with Jibreel alayhi salam? Al Imam al Suyuti rahimahullah says, the greater the task the angel has been given, the greater the size of the angel. So that tells you right away that Jibreel alayhi salam is even bigger than that. He's the biggest of the angels and the greatest in size because he has the greatest of tasks. Okay? Jibreel alayhi salam also belongs to what's known as the most elite class of the Mala'ika. Al Muqassimati Amra. The scholars traditionally called them as they are mentioned in the Qur'an, those who apportion the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they are four. The first of them, 
Jibreel alayhi salam. And he is the angel that through him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's very beautiful how the scholars classed it. They said through him, Hayatul Qulub, the life of the heart. Why? Because he brings revelation. And through revelation, our hearts live. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala apportions through him Al Wahi. Okay, so each and every single Prophet that received the revelation received it from Jibreel alayhi salam. What's the other thing that Jibreel alayhi salam does? What else does he deal with? Every nation that rejects the revelation is also dealt with with Jibreel alayhi salam. So anytime you read about a nation, and of course Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, Ahlaknahum lamma zalamu that we destroyed them when they oppressed, when they transgressed. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah says, Allah never sent Jibreel to destroy a nation simply because they disbelieved. Allah sends Jibreel to destroy a nation when that nation becomes aggressive with the Prophet that's been sent to them and the believers. That's when Allah sends Jibreel. And Jibreel deals with them in a mighty way. The entire, uh, pe the people of Lut alayhi salam, that entire city, was destroyed by the tip of one of Jibreel's wings. They were lifted up and they were destroyed by the tip of one of his wings. So it shows you the strength of Jibreel alayhi salam. And in that, Asuyuti rahimahullah, he says that in that is a sign that these angels, you know, though if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded him to bring the revelation, Jibreel doesn't argue or debate with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when Allah says, okay, now these people are done. They respond to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when Allah tells Jibreel enough, then it's enough. All right, but through him, Hayatul Qulub, the, the life of the heart, spiritual life. Who's the second angel that you often hear, even uh, mentioned with Jibreel alayhi salam? Mikal or Mikail alayhi salam. And through Mikail alayhi salam, physical life is a portion. That's how the scholars describe him. Hayatul Nas in that sense, uh, provision, a risk, wal riyah, wal ghayth. Okay, provision, sustenance, uh, rain, winds. Mikail alayhi salam is the angel that Allah has chosen to move them in certain ways when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands him to do so. So there's a very famous hadith in Sahih Muslim where a man is walking and he hears a voice coming from the clouds and it says, Isqi hadiqa to fulan, go and water the garden of so and so. And the man follows that cloud and water would not come out of it until it reached a particular garden and it fell on this man's particular garden. That's Mikail alayhi salam, okay? The third, the next two actually have to do with death. So two of them are in relation to life, two of them are in relation to death. The next two, Israfil alayhi salam, who Israfil deals with the taking of people's souls massively or collectively. Okay, qabd al-arwah, taking the souls collectively. How Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created this great angel with one task and one task alone, and that is to blow the horn. And the Prophet ﷺ said, I lost my appetite for this world when I saw Israfil alayhi salam with his lips already puckered to it, his eyes gazing at the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, fixated like stars, waiting for the command. Meaning the entire world rests on, <laughs> and that's it. And the Prophet ﷺ said, I lost my appetite, any appetite I had for this world, I lost it when I saw Israfil alayhi salam. The fourth one deals with the taking of the souls individually. What's his name? Actually, that name doesn't exist. Malak al-Mawt, the angel of death. He's only called the angel of death. Allah and the Messenger وسلم, referred to him as the angel of death. Malak al-Mawt, alladhi wukila bikum, who's been assigned to you to take your souls when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees so. So this group of angels, they are al-muqassimati amra, those that apportion the command of Allah. They're the most elite class of the angels, and the most elite of that class is Jibreel alayhi salam. Now what's Jibreel's name? What are, how can you say the name of Jibreel alayhi salam? What are some of the ways to pronounce his name? Jibreel, Jibra'il, 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 Jibreel. Those are five ways that have been narrated through the various qiraat. All right, Jibreel, Jibra'il, 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 and Jibreel, okay? Now, obviously, the name is not from an Arabic origin, right? Or, or it's not something that, that you, know, you, can, you can dissect uh, simply by using the Arabic language. So you go to the origin of that name. Now, what do you keep on hearing? You tell me what you keep on hearing. Jibreel, Mikail, Israfil, Israel. What do you keep on hearing? Il, right? Il means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's no dispute there about the meaning of Il. 
The first part of the name, though, has caused a lot of debate, right? What does Jibra mean? What does Mika mean? The traditional opinion, which has been traced to the Sahaba, uh, to Ibn Abbas and to Ali ibn Hussein and many others, is that Jibra means Abd, means servant, the slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the one that you'll find in Tafsir al-Tabari and so on and so forth, that Jibra'il is Abdullah, okay? And Mika'il is Ubaidullah, which would be the smaller Abd. You know, in, in the, amongst the companions, you'll see Abdullah has a younger brother named Ubaidullah. Or Abdullah has a son named Ubaidullah. That's the traditional opinion. However, when you study the root of Jibra, it comes from the root of Jabr, which means strength. Which also ties into another description that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him, which is Shadeedul Quwa. The one who Allah gave a massive amount of strength. Okay, Allah, Allah praises his strength two times. Allah calls him Shadeedul Quwa, the Quwa. He possesses a mighty amount of strength. So it could either be that, Abdullah, or the one who's been given an amazing amount of strength from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All right, so that's his name and that's the meaning of his name. Now, what are some ways that the Prophet ﷺ and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala re referred to him? This is truly interesting. When I started my research, the very first day my eyes got big because I started off with Al-Bukhari. I said, first I'm gonna take all the hadith about Jibreel from Al-Bukhari. The very first hadith I pulled from Al-Bukhari that mentioned Jibreel, the Prophet ﷺ said, Jibreel sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I was like, what? I studied Kitab al-Wahid, the book of Revelation a million times and I never paid attention to that. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam referred to Jibreel, he often said Jibreel sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Which obviously, we usually refer to Jibreel as alayhi salam. May peace be on to him. But the Prophet, peace be upon him, invoked salawat on him as well, prayers upon him as well. لِعُلُوِّ شَأْنِ As the scholars say, to show his status amongst those that the Prophet ﷺ was referring to. The only person that you see the Prophet ﷺ do that with other, other than Jibreel, or the only creature that you see the Prophet ﷺ do that with other than Jibreel on a frequent basis is Ibrahim ﷺ, which was traditionally understood, again, to show the position of Ibrahim ﷺ or ﷺ in our faith, right? So Jibreel ﷺ, sometimes the Prophet ﷺ would say that, all right? Another thing, the Prophet ﷺ often doesn't even say his name. You know how he refers to him? He says, Man inda Rabbi, the one who's with my Lord. Right? To show how close he is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Man inda Rabbi. Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to him in multiple ways. And I can't go through each and every single time Allah refers to Jabir Islam. It's too extensive of a study. Inshallah ta'ala in the future we'll be able to get to it. But just the common themes. The most common theme that you find is the word ruh, spirit or soul, okay? Allah calls him ar-ruh al-qudus, the holy spirit. Allah calls him ar-ruh al-amin, the trustworthy spirit, the truthful spirit. Allah calls him ruhana, our spirit, right? Which is a means of veneration in the Arabic language. When you, attri when you attribute something to yourself, it's a means of venerating it. So when Allah says, Baytullah, the house of Allah. It's a means of venerating the Kaaba. Likewise, Allah says about Jibreel alayhi salam, our spirit, as a means of venerating uh, Jibreel alayhi salatu was salam. Now, what does that mean? Why is Jibreel constantly being referred to as a ruh, the spirit? And there's so much beauty to the explanations that are given, all right? One of them is that Jibreel brings what gives a person a soul, what settles the heart, right? In essence, you know, Imam Suyuti says, أَوَ مَنْ كَانَ مَيْتًا فَأَحْيَيْنَاهُ As Allah says, weren't you dead and Allah gave you life? God gives life through what? Revelation. So, in, in, in some of the scholars, they said that he's called that because he brings that which gives you a soul in the first place, which gives you life, right? And if you dissect where the root letters uh, of ruh, then it's the same root as raha, which is to comfort, which is to settle. Just as the soul settles the body, Jibreel alayhi salam brings that which settles the heart. So he's called ar-ruh. Another one is that ruhuha ay khayruha. That, that the spirit of something means in the Arabic language the best of something. It's Allah praising the purity of Jibreel alayhi salam. Like he's the cream of the crop. He's khayruha. A third one, which is the most interesting one, and the one that Asuyuti chooses and the one that has the greatest evidence to it, and it's quite fascinating, is that Jibreel is the first living, breathing creature of Allah. He is the first creature that's ever been given a soul. Without any parents, 
without anything, without anything to, you know, any prerequisites to it. He was simply brought into existence and he was the first thing brought into existence with a soul. How is he brought into existence? You know, when babies are born, they make all these noises and they figure things out, right? They're, they're cute noises sometimes and they're not so cute noises at other times. They make all these noises and they start getting to Baba and Mama or whatever it is that they get to, right? What about the Malaika? What about Jibreel Islam? When he was brought into existence, what did he say, right? Sa'id ibn Musayyib radiallahu anhu narrates, مَا نَهَضَ مَلَكٌ حَتَّى قَالْ لَا حَوْلَ وَلَا قُوَّةَ إِلَّا بِاللَّهِ As the angels are brought into existence, they say, لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله. There is no power or might except that of God. We have none. <laughs> so as Jibreel was brought into existence, this first soul, he said, لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله. And as these angels are constantly being created, because they're perpetually being created, they have no gender, they have no desires, they have nothing to distract them from worshiping their creator. They all come into existence saying, لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله. So that's one interpretation is that he's the first. And there's some evidence to that inshallah ta'ala, uh, which hopefully I'll get, I will get a chance to mention inshallah ta'ala in a few minutes. Also Allah calls him what? Rasulun Kareem. That he's Rasulun Kareem. He's a noble messenger. Just as the prophet that's been sent to you is a noble messenger, the messenger that's been sent to him is also a noble messenger. Allah says, ذِي قُوَّةٍ عِنْدَ ذِي الْعَرْشِ مَكِينَ Allah says he possesses mighty strength, and why would he need to possess mighty strength? I mean, think about it. Allah speaks to him directly with revelation. And then he has to guard that revelation from anything that tries to interfere. And then he deals with those that reject revelation. So he has to possess a mighty amount of strength. And Allah says, عند ذي العرش مكين. He is stable in his position with the owner of the throne. The Prophet ﷺ said that Jibreel salam resides directly under the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he's stable in his position. Allah says, Muta'in, thamma amin. He is obeyed lovingly. And he's trustworthy. And subhanAllah, some of the scholars even connected Muta' and Amin together. Okay? What is it that made the Prophet ﷺ so beloved to people before being a messenger of God? as al Amin, his truthfulness, his trustworthiness. So some of the scholars say, likewise, none of the angels, you'll find this in the dynamics of the conversations between Jibreel and the rest of the angels, they love him, they obey him, they trust him. They don't question him, they recognize that he is their leader and he's beloved to the rest of the angels. They know his position with Allah and so they all love him and they all obey him. Allah also says about Jibreel alayhi salam, ذو mirra, that he is completely free of fault. And Ibn Abbas anhu said, if Allah was to praise a certain quality of Jibreel alayhi salam, then you could still have all of those impurities that have been associated to him by other people. So Allah decided to defend Jibreel alayhi salam by just simply saying, ذو mirra, he is free from all imperfections. So he embodies perfection in body, mind and soul. And Ibn Abbas anhu said it refers to his, his size and his beauty. Right? And there is absolutely no deficiency in Jibreel alayhi salam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created him with absolute perfection. The last name that I'm going to give you guys, and then we'll move on because of time, is not necessarily a name from Allah or the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam. It's from Waraqa, the cousin of Khadija radiallahu anha. When the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam went to, Khadija, went to Khadija, and then Khadija said, let's go to Waraqa, who knows the Bible and he knows the scriptures before. And let's see what he says about this encounter of yours in Hira. Waraqa said, this is Al-Namus. Al-Namus, who was sent to Musa alayhi salam. Now, the word Namus is an interesting word. It's interesting that he chose that word. What does the word Jasus mean in the Arabic language? Bayina students? None of the Bayina students said anything. That's sad. All right, Jasus means spy, okay? <laughs> Jasus means spy, all right? Is there anyone in here who's a Jasus? You know, Sheikh Kishk rahimahullah, he used to say, may Allah and the angels send their prayers on the second row, not the first row. Because all the Jawasis, all the Jasuses are in the first row. All right? <laughs> no offense, guys, in the first row. All right? <laughs> now, Jasus is a spy. What is the technical meaning of Jasus? It's a person who carries an evil secret. All right? Jasus is someone who has an evil secret. Why did Waraqa call him Namus? Namus is someone who carries a beautiful secret. He's concealing a beautiful secret, which is the secret of revelation. So those are the ways Jibreel Islam is referred to in the Quran and the Sunnah, 
What did he look like? Now, Jibreel took on multiple forms, right? He took on a human form. Sometimes he'd take on an angelic form, but it wasn't his full form. So the Prophet ﷺ would see a light and he would hear the voice of Jibreel. Likewise, the Prophets before, but they weren't seeing Jibreel in his full form. What does he look like when he's in his full form? The Prophet ﷺ says, رَأَيْتُ جِبْرِيلِ I saw Jibreel وَلَهُ سِتُ مِئَةِ جَنَاحِ And he had 600 wings, not two or three or four. 600 wings. Not only that, the Prophet ﷺ said he filled up the entire horizon and he was sitting on a throne that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provided for him. And the Prophet ﷺ said, not only are those 600 wings spread out, he said, يَنْتَسِرُ مِنْ رِيشِهِ التَّهَوِيلُ مِنَ الدُّرِّ وَالْيَاقُوتِ there are constant rubies and pearls falling from his wings. It's just a plethora of rubies, pearls, and all of these precious things falling from the wings of Jibreel In a narration in Ahmad, the Prophet said, the color of his wings are khadra, are green, and the soles of his feet are green. Can you imagine how beautiful of a, of a sight that was for the Prophet And of course, a horrifying sight as well because of how, how huge Jibreel was. The Prophet ﷺ only saw Jibreel in this form twice. It's a very hard sight to grasp. It is a very magnificent, you know, it's, it's, it's a huge thing to grasp. Jibreel in his original form. That's what he looks like in angelic form. All right, unparalleled by any of the angels. Okay, what does he look like in human form? Now Jibreel can assume multiple human forms. He can look different, okay? But when he came to the Prophet ﷺ, he had a consistent human form. Now I'm going to give you guys the full hadith from An-Nasai because it's, it's, it's beautiful how the Prophet ﷺ is explaining to the companions after Isra, after Isra al Mi'raj how they look. He said, I saw Musa salam, And he said, Musa salam looked like a man from Shanu'ah or Az-Zut. Two tribes, Shanu'ah or Az-Zut. What is the Prophet ﷺ talking about? Shanu'ah and Az-Zut are two African tribes. Not only are they African tribes, Az-Zut were, were a tribe that had darker skin than anyone else. The Prophet ﷺ is speaking to a people who are emerging from one of the most racist societies on the planet. And he's telling them that, look, Musa doesn't look like Christian Bale. All right, Musa salam looks like one of those people that you guys actually used to look down upon. The man who Allah spoke to, Kalimullah, directly, the man who's mentioned more times in the Quran than anyone else, is a dark black man. Deal with that if you're racist, right? So the Prophet ﷺ says, that's what Musa looked like. And actually in one narration, he pointed to Ahlul Badiyah. He pointed to some of the Bedouins and said, look, that's what Musa ﷺ looked like. All right? So that you get a good idea of it, okay? Secondly, he says, وَرَأَيْتُ عِيسَى بْنُ مَرْيَمَ And I saw Isa السلام, And he said, Isa looks like Urwa bin Mas'ud. He pointed to Urwa bin Mas'ud. And he said, Isa resembles Urwa bin Mas'ud رضي الله تعالى عنه. And then he said, وَرَأَيْتُ Ibrahim." And I saw Ibrahim السلام, Who did Ibrahim look like? He said, I've never seen a man that looked more like me than Ibrahim السلام. Never. And SubhanAllah, what's so profound about that? If you go and you look up the physical description of Abraham from purely Judeo-Christian sources, here's how he's described. Obviously the Shamal of the Prophet Sallallahu the descriptions of the Prophet peace be upon him are far more extensive. But what did Abraham look like from Judeo-Christian sources? Broad shoulders, long black hair that almost reached his shoulders, a thick black beard that had gray hair sprinkled throughout it, and deep black eyes. That's a description of Abraham. The Prophet Sallallahu he saw Uthman radiallahu anhu and he told the wife of Uthman, who was his daughter Ruqayya, he said, no one looks more like your father, Rasulullah Sallallahu and your grandfather Ibrahim Sallallahu than your husband Uthman. Uthman looked like the Prophet Sallallahu who looked like Ibrahim Sallallahu Okay? And SubhanAllah, actually, you know, if you read in Al-Waqidi, the history of Al-Waqidi, the footprints in Maqam Ibrahim, some people actually commented that they matched the footprints of the Prophet Sallallahu So even his foot size would be the same as Ibrahim Sallallahu Okay? Then he said, وَرَأَيْتُ Jibril," And I saw Jibreel alayhi salam. And he said, Jibreel looked like Dihya ibn Khalifa al-Kalbi radiallahu ta'ala anhu. You guys are like, who is that? Dihya ibn Khalifa from Banu Kalb. Now, Dihya is a very interesting man. How many of you have heard of Dihya before? Right? Not many of you. Dihya is not a household name, all right, from the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam. But he was there in all of the Ghazawat. He served in all of the battles with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was there 
at the time that Jibreel presented himself to a large group of companions, which completely puts to rest anyone saying that Dihya was posing as Jibreel. He was there when Jibreel came in human form amongst many of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. Jibreel Islam didn't look exactly like Dihya, but if you saw him up close, all right, he looked almost like him. But you could tell if he was in front of you, directly in front of you, that he's not Dihya radiallahu ta'ala anhu. But who is Dihya? All right, why is it that Jibreel chose him? Dihya was called the Yusuf of Banu Kalf. What did Yusuf Islam? What did the women comment about Yusuf Islam? That had the Malakun Karim. This is a noble. This is a beautiful angel, right? So Dihya was called the Yusuf of Banu Kalf. Women could not keep their hands off of Dihya. All right, which is why Dihya used to stay away from public sight for the most part, because women would throw themselves at Dihya radiallahu anhu, and the Prophet sallallahu in his wisdom, you know, if, and I happened to come across this actually, I found Dihya's mention, the Prophet sallallahu sent him to Heraclius. Okay, and Ibn Hajar rahimullah said, because of how handsome Dihya is, when he went to Heraclius in Jerusalem, to the Romans, he caused a ruckus in the city, everyone came out to see him. Right, so everyone wanted to know what the messenger of the Muslims looked like, what the messenger of the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam looked like. So Dihya is a really, really good-looking man. All right, and Jibril Islam, does he have the form of Dihya? I mean, it, how close is it? It's so close that Um Salama radiallahu anha says, one time I was sitting with the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and all of a sudden, I didn't, you know, she didn't even hear the door open and close. She just saw Dihya sitting next to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So she said, "Kharaj, I just left." Right. And then the Prophet وسلم, you know, he came to me and I didn't hear the door open or close again. So it's not like he left again. He came to me and he says, Mother Aiti, what did you see? She said, I saw Dihya. So she said that the Prophet, وسلم, he smiled, then he then he stood on the on the menbar, he stood on the pulpit, and he said, Atani Jibreel. Jibreel just came to me. And she said, That's when I realized that that wasn't Dihya. Right? So he looked strikingly similar to Dihya radiallahu ta'ala anhu. However, how is it, did Jibreel always look like Dihya? So when he went to Maryam, did he look like Dihya when he went to, no. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah said, when Jibreel was sent to a prophet, he would resemble the most beautiful person of that prophet's people. So if he was sent to an African prophet, he resembled the most beautiful person from that people. When he, if he was sent to an Asian prophet, he resembled the most beautiful Asian man that was amongst those people. He resembled whoever was the most beautiful amongst them. SubhanAllah, as a sign of his nobility. So it's not a consistent form, but when he was sent to the Prophet in human form, this is what he looked like. Just that absolute perfection. The most beautiful man that was amongst um, the Arabs of that time. Now, how old is Jibreel Islam? What is his age, right? We said that one of the opinions is that he is the first creature that's been given a spirit. What is the evidence for that statement? It's the authentic hadith of the Prophet لَمَّا خَلَقَ اللَّهُ الْجَنَّةِ وَالنَّارِ أَرْسَلَ جِبْرِيلِ إِلَى الْجَنَّةِ When Allah created paradise and hellfire, He sent Jibreel to go look at Jannah. Which tells you that Jibreel was there before Jannah or hellfire even existed. Now obviously human beings and jinn don't, don't come into the picture until after the creation of heaven and hell. All right, and obviously Jibreel is Sayyidul Malaika, he's the chief of the angels, so it makes sense that he's the first of them that's created. So this is our first encounter now that we see between Jibreel and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah creates paradise and hellfire. And he sends Jibreel to go look at paradise and he says, Ya Jibreel, he says, Oh Jibreel, idhab ila al-jannah, go see jannah, wanzur ilayha wa ila ma'adatu li ahliha. Go look at it and see what I've prepared for the inhabitants of it. Now there are, no one's been created yet, but Allah says, Jibreel, go look at it and see what I've prepared for those that will eventually enter into Jannah. And SubhanAllah, what's profound about that, you know that new car smell, that new house smell, right? Now with Jannah, obviously it always has the new Jannah smell. It always is new, right? It just never gets old, right? But Jibreel is the first one to feast his eyes on that place with its rivers and palaces and mansions and SubhanAllah, everything that he saw. So Jibreel comes back to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala with a sense of excitement. And he says, فَبِعِزَّتِكَ لَا يَسْمَعُ بِهَا أَحَدٌ إِلَّا دَخَلَهَا He said, I swear by your glory, O Allah, no one's going to hear about this place except that they're going to enter it. I don't care who they are, what kind of creation they are, no one's going to know that a place like this exists and miss, miss out on it. Right? Then Rasulullah said, Allah surrounded Jannah with obstacles. 
hardships. It's not that easy. He wanted to show Jibreel, it's not like that. He sends Jibreel back to Jannah to look at it again. Jibreel السلام, comes back the first time he was excited. The second time, he's worried. He says, أحد. He said, I swear by your glory, now I'm afraid no one's going to get into Jannah. Right? How are they going to get past these hardships and these obstacles? Then Allah sent Jibreel السلام, to look at hellfire. And he said, look at it and see what I've prepared for its inhabitants. Jibreel came back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he says, فَبِعِزَّتِكَ لَا يَسْمَعُ بِهَا أَحَدٌ فَيَدْخُلُهَا He said, I swear by your glory, no one's going to hear about hellfire and enter it. When people know what hellfire is like, they're going to make sure that they avoid the things that would cause them to enter into it. So no one's going to enter hellfire. Then Allah surrounded hellfire بِالشَّهَوَاتِ with desires and ease, tests, trials in a different way بِالنَّعِيمِ Right? With goodness. Jibreel goes and he looks at it and he comes back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he said, فَبِعِزَّتِكَ لَقَدْ خِفْتُ أَنْ لَا يَنْجُوا مِنْهَا أَحَدْ He said, I swear by your glory, now I'm afraid no one's going to be safe from hellfire. Now what this shows you right away, by the way, is that Jibreel has a love for the people of Iman. He has a love for the people of faith before they've even been created. How did Allah put Jibreel to ease? Allah said, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ هُمْ فِي صَلَاتِهِمْ خَاشِعُونَ the believers have succeeded. Those who have humility in their prayers. The secret of your success was already put in the moment that hellfire and paradise were created. Before you were created, salah was made the determining factor. Your prayer. Allah tells Jibreel, no, not everyone will enter into hellfire. The believers who have humility in their prayers, they will enter into paradise. They will be saved and they will enter into paradise. SubhanAllah, it starts from there. But this tells us something about Jibreel alayhi salam from the very start, right? What he's like, his character in that regard, his love for Ahlul Iman. Now, what is the relationship then between Allah and Jibreel alayhi salam? Number one, he is Kalimullah min al Malaika. He is the one that Allah speaks to from the angels. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, doesn't Allah speak to all of the angels? No. Just as there are particular human beings that Allah speaks to directly, there are particular angels that Allah speaks to directly. So He speaks to Al-Muqassimati Amra, all four of the angels we mentioned that apportion the command of Allah. There are narrations of direct communication between Allah and them. But Allah always speaks directly to Jibreel. So for the other angels, Allah might send Jibreel to them. right? Even the others of Al-Muqassimati Amra, those that apportion the command of Allah. Allah never sends another angel to talk to Jibreel. Allah speaks to Jibreel directly, then Jibreel goes out and delivers the message to the rest of the angels. So he is Kalimullah from the angels. With the prophets, and we see that frequently, and many ahadith will cover it, Nada Jibreel, Allah calls Jibreel, right? Whereas never the opposite where someone else was sent to Jibreel. With the other prophets of Allah, there is not a single prophet of Allah that you study, except that there is a mention of Jibreel. Seriously, just go through Qasas al-Anbiya, the stories of the prophets, you'll find a mention of Jibreel alayhi salam in some way, shape or form. He's got to be there because he has been sent to 124,000 prophets. In the hadith of in Muslim Imam Ahmad, there were 124,000 anbiya. Amongst them, 315 were messengers, were rusul. He has been sent to each and every single one of them to teach them, to raise them, to support them, to protect them. He was there. He's, he's got a first-hand account. What is another title that he has with them? He is Nasir al-Anbiya. He's the one who supports the Prophets. He aids the Prophets. He doesn't just aid them by bringing them revelation. He plays a multitude of roles in all of their lives. In fact, if you go through them quickly, like where are the narrations that mention Jibreel Islam? I'm not going to go into detail with any particular Prophet story, but just some highlights to get an idea, and then we'll move on to the Prophet ﷺ. With Adam salam, there are narrations that mention Jibreel was the angel that Allah sent to gather the dirt that would be used to create Adam salam. Are any of them sahih in and of themselves? No, but that shows you where the mentions of Jibreel come that early on in the very creation of Adam salam. When Adam salam was expelled from paradise, did Allah communicate directly with Adam anymore? Did He? No. Now Jibreel becomes the, 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 the uh, intermediary between Allah and Adam salam. In Jannah, Adam salam was spoken to directly. And Imam Al-Zarqashi rahimahullah says that actually is probably a greater blessing that was taken away from him than Jannah. That Adam used to be spoken to directly from Allah. When he left paradise, Allah started to send Jibreel to him only. Jibreel became the means of communication to Adam alayhi salam. 
One Adam passes away. They didn't know what to do with his body, obviously, because human beings had never experienced death before. Allah sent Jibreel alayhi salam and a group of angels. They washed the body of Adam alayhi salam. They shrouded Adam alayhi salam. They buried Adam alayhi salam. So he's there from the very start, even with Adam alayhi salam. You also find the narrations, obviously, that mention him with Idris alayhi salam. Idris, who is Enoch, the son of Sheath, the grandson of Adam alayhi salam. And Idris, what you can take from the narrations about him is that he's a man with ulu al himma. He's a man with high ambitions that you know, is very prone to calling people to good and forbidding evil. القلم, the first one to write with a pen and so on and so forth. A person who loves da'wah. There's a very famous narration about Idris alayhi salam that Idris wanted to know how much time he has left. Why did he want to know how much time he has left? Because you know, you know, for people, for most people, it's that you, know, you want to party it up until the last day. Like if you know the date of your death, well, okay, you know, I'm going to party it up. And then on that day, tawbah, right? Just have it on your calendar, repent, then die, right? It doesn't work that way, right? Is that why Idris wanted to know the date of his death? No. Idris Islam wanted to know the date of his death or he wanted to know how much time he had left because of his aspirations of da'wah. Because of his, he wanted to know how to adjust his goals accordingly. So he tells Jibreel alayhi salam, to find out for him. And the reason why I mention this narration right now is because one thing to note about Jibreel as well, he is the only one that can take a prophet through the heavens and bring him down. He's the only one that can ascend or descend with any of the prophets of Allah through the heavens. He takes Idris alayhi salam and he ascends with him. And in, this, you know, in, in these athar, which are primarily from the people of the book, he meets the angel of death in the fourth heaven. And in the fourth heaven, Jibreel alayhi salam asks the angel of death, that this is the servant of Allah Idris and he wants to know how much time he has left. And the angel of death says, you know, I was amazed when Allah told me to take this man's soul in the fourth heaven. So he dies in the fourth heaven. Ibn Hajar rahimahullah, who obviously is the most strict of hadith, he says that these narrations are strengthened and corroborated by the evidence from the Prophet Sallallahu that when the Prophet Sallallahu went on the night of Al-Isra' al Mi'raj, where did he meet Idris? In the fourth heaven. So Idris is the only man that ever died in the heavens, right? And Allah, and that's one of the interpretations of وَرَفَعْنَاهُ مَكَانًا عَلِيَةً that we raised him to a high position. And biblically, Enoch dies in the fourth heaven. Okay, so it's corroborated by the evidence from the Messenger وسلم, as well. So you find that mention of Jibreel responding to the request of a prophet, taking him through the heavens to meet Allah or to meet the angel of death, uh, to help him, to answer his requests. The most, uh, the most mentions of Jibreel Islam with any previous prophet are with Ibrahim and his family. So Ibrahim, who is subhanAllah mentioned so highly by the Prophet this is, this is the millah of Ibrahim, this is the religion, the way of Ibrahim alayhi salam. You'll find the mention of Jibreel alayhi salam with Ibrahim on numerous occasions. You find it from the moment that Ibrahim was thrown into that fire. Now Ibn Abbas anhu says when Ibrahim was to be thrown into the fire, all of the angels wanted to help him. Mikael was waiting for a command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to put the fire out. I mean, Allah could have easily just caused it to storm and the fire goes out. All of the angels are waiting and wondering why there's a delay in the command to do away with the fire or to protect Ibrahim alayhi salam. So Jibreel comes to Ibrahim alayhi salam and he says, haja? Is there anything you want me to do for you? Ibrahim knows why Jibreel is asking that question. He says, Amma ilayk fala. He said, Look, if it's from you, I don't want anything from you. He said, If it's from Allah, then okay. He recognizes that Jibreel was not given a command from Allah to put the fire out. So if it's from Allah, then I'll take it. If it's from you, Jibreel, look, Allah has a plan, right? So Jibreel is telling Ibrahim, Lima la tas'alhu. Why don't you just ask him? Just ask Allah. It'll all be dealt with. Ibrahim alayhi salam says, Ilmuhu bihali kafin an su'ali. Allah knows my situation, his knowledge of my situation makes it irrelevant for me to ask. Now that's not for us, that's for the prophets of Allah. Meaning Allah knows, God knows what's happening right now. So Abraham knows that, you know what, Allah is going to make a way out of this. All right. So Jibreel alayhi salam wants to help him and that's actually the origin of the words according to Abdullah bin Mas'ud and many of the companions of Hasbi Allah wa Ni'mal Wakil. That Ibrahim was the first one in that situation to say Allah is enough for me and he's the best of protectors. And obviously the plan of God, the plan of Allah was what? That the fire wasn't going to burn Abraham. Kuni bardan wa salama. Be cool and peaceful on Ibrahim alayhi salam. So we see it there, right? We see it from that moment in the fire. 
Ibrahim Islam moves on. He goes to, you know, Hajar alayhi salam comes into the picture. Ismail is born alayhi salam. Then obviously Allah commands Ibrahim to leave them in the desert. Then comes the very long, one of the longest hadith actually in Sahih al-Bukhari is this hadith where the Prophet ﷺ mentions Hajar running from, you know, from, from Safa to Marwa, running around, carrying her baby Ishmael, looking for anyone to help her. She's in an abandoned place. There's no one there, right? And the Prophet ﷺ says, فَإِذَا هِيَ بِسَوْتِ All of a sudden she heard a sound. فَقَالَتْ أَقْبِلْ إِنْ كَانَ عِنْدَكَ خَيْرٍ She said, come forth if you have anything good to offer. So the Prophet ﷺ says, فَإِذَا جِبْرِيلٍ Suddenly it was Jibreel. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, Jibreel did this. All he did was this. He struck the ground with his heel. This is called Hadith Musalsal, which means a Hadith that has a signal in it, Hadith that has wasf. He just struck the ground. So every narrator of this Hadith had to do that, by the way. Ibn Abbas said he just did this. And Shu'bah said he just did this. And every single narrator says he just did this. When Jibreel did that, the water obviously started coming from the earth in, 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 you know, in, in huge loads. Zamzam comes bursting out of the ground. And the Prophet said, Rahim Allah um Ismail, may Allah have mercy on the mother of Ismail. What she did was she carved out the well because she was afraid that the water would go all over the place and nothing would be left. And the Prophet said, had she not done that, then the entire earth would have been touched by Zamzam. Each and every single part of the earth. Now SubhanAllah, think about the miracle of Zamzam, right? You know how big it is in dimensions? Eight by three. It's only eight by three. If any of you have ever seen Zamzam, ever gotten a chance to actually go down there and see it, it's only eight by three. It's a very small well. If you see how they fill the coolers now in the Haram, they've got, literally, they've got hoses that are connected to Zamzam and they're constantly filling up the coolers. All of that, till today, you are drinking from the foot of Jibreel. From that moment that Jibreel did this, Shadid al Quwa, with his strength, Allah has caused that well to constantly produce. Talk about a wonder of the world. Now scientifically, I need to mention this because this is phenomenal. Zamzam's only eight by three. And in an official research that was done on Zamzam, it pumps 8,000 liters per second. 8,000 liters per second. That means 691 million liters per day. Zamzam. <laughs> Think about how many millions of gallons. I mean, they're, you know, subhanAllah, people are constantly drinking from it. It has never dried up. That's just from the strike of Jibreel's foot. Okay? You're still drinking from it till now. So that's your connection to Jibreel alayhi salam until today. SubhanAllah. Now, obviously, that's with Ismail and Hajar. So he bails them out. Ibrahim alayhi salam, on the other hand, has settled now with Sarah. And they've come to this acceptance that, you know what? We're just not going to have kids. Ibrahim alayhi salam was 100 years old around that age. Uh, Sarah, his wife, was 10 years younger than him. So that would make her about 90 years old. And they've kind of just, they've accepted now that we're not going to have kids. They've, they've settled. They're okay with it. She's barren. That's, that's it. It's the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, obviously, Ibrahim lives a very long life. Extreme, historically speaking, Ibrahim alayhi salam outlived his wives. He outlived his children. He outlived many of his grandchildren. He resettled in Palestine, in Khalil. Okay. He got married again over there. He had six children and he's buried there. So if you were to put a timeline on, on Abraham's life, on Ibrahim's life, it's a very, very, very long life that he lived, okay? Now, what happens in this situation now? As they've kind of settled and gotten used to this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, هَلْ أَتَاكَ حَدِيثُ اللَّيْفِ إِبْرَاهِيمِ الْمُكْرَمِينَ The noble guests of Ibrahim come to visit him. Who are the noble guests of Ibrahim alayhi salam? They definitely included Jibreel. According to most of the scholars, it included Mikal, and Malik al maut the angel of death as well. So it's Al-Muqassimati Amra minus Israfil, because Israfil has another job to do. But a group of guests, some angels come to visit Ibrahim alayhi They don't announce themselves, they don't say that they're angels, but they, they just appear to be strangers just walking through wayfarers. Ibrahim alayhi salam sees them as they come. If dakhalu alayhi faqalu salama. They say salam to Ibrahim alayhi salam. Ibrahim doesn't say, who are you? Right? Ibrahim salam says, Salamun qawmun munkarun. He says, Salamun, which according to Al-Baghawi is like if someone says to you, Assalamu alaikum, and you say, Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. He greeted them with an enthusiastic salam. Like, go ahead, come on in, guys, have a seat. Right? It wasn't like, you know, nowadays, you don't say salam to someone unless you know them, right? It's one of the signs of the day of judgment. 
And you know, what's a greater sign of the day of judgment is New York, where you don't greet someone unless you know them, right? You can't even say, hi, how are you to someone unless you know them, okay? But salam is something that's taken away. Allah is showing us the adab of Ibrahim alayhi salam. He tells these guests, come on in, tafadlalu, salamu alaykum. Have a seat, guys. Faragha ila ahlihi. He goes and he tells Sarah, we've got guests. Faja'a bi'izr in samin. Yani ja'a yuhminuhu bi nafsi, as the scholar said. He came carrying this huge meal, this huge roasted cow, right? Cooked, done well, you know, a, a huge portion. He puts it on the table. And, you know, this is his, his, his generosity towards them. But what happens? The true definition of awkward silence. They just look at him. These angels cannot eat. They physically cannot eat. Even when they appear to be human beings, Allah has completely taken desire away from them, completely taken food and drink away from them. So what does Ibrahim Islam do? You know, in some cultures, the appropriate thing to do, there are some parts of the world that I've, where they actually put the food on the table and the hosts leave and they let you finish the food and come back so that you're not shy. And some cultures, primarily Arab Desi culture, they open your mouth and just force it down your throat, right? La tastahi, no takalluf, right? Just eat, right? And you actually have to like hide, or you gotta eat at a really slow pace unless you wanna eat like four plates of makloob or biryani, right? It's, it's ayb, it's shameful if you don't do that, right? Ibrahim Islam, he has good adab, he has good manners. So he doesn't do that. He just qarrabahu ilayhim. He just pushes the tray closer to them. They still didn't touch the food. It's still an awkward silence. He says, Ala ta'kulun? Aren't you going to eat? Now in that situation, was there a conversation that took place? According to Ibn Abbas who narrations from him and Sa'id ibn al-Jubayr and others, at that point the angels, in order to make an excuse for themselves, they said, لا نأكل شيء إلا بثمني. Look, we don't eat things unless we pay for them. So Ibrahim said, fine. كلوا وأدوا ثمنا. Go ahead and eat it and then pay later. They said, what's the price? How much does it cost? He said that you start, Bismillah, in the name of Allah and that you end in the praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there's an apparent way out, right? For Ibrahim Islam that he made. So the angels now say nothing. At that point, what does Allah say? I mean, think about it. If you were in the place of Ibrahim Islam, you just served the generous meal and they're just kind of looking, they're looking at you like, can't do anything about that, right? At that point, Ibrahim السلام, became scared on the inside. Notice, fi nafsi. He didn't say anything, it was inside of him. At that point, the angel said, Okay, fine. لا تخف. Don't be afraid. On top of that, بَشَّرُوهُ بِغُلَامٍ عَلِيمٍ They gave him the glad tidings of a knowledgeable young son. This old man and his old wife. By the way, Allah has a knowledgeable young son that's on the way. This is something to take place in the future. In fact, many of the scholars say the angels were not going to give him the bushra at that time. They weren't going to give him the glad tidings at that time, but to put him to ease. بَشَّرُوهُ بِغُلَامٍ عَلِيمٍ Okay? Now Sarah is listening in from the other room. Because she's getting scared too now because these guys aren't doing anything. So they must be up to no good. As soon as they say that, what happens? She comes screaming hysterically, slapping her face. He's old. He can't have kids. I can't have kids. What are you talking about? How is this happening? You know, what's going on here? Now Jibreel is the one who's speaking now because Jibreel is the one who gives the bushra of the child in the first place. So Jibreel always answers with one word first. Kadalik. Look, it's just like that. And Al-Qurtubi says because that's the tarbiyah of the malaika. That's how the angels were raised. They don't ask those types of questions. How is this happening? <laughs> Allah decided it's going to happen. It's just going to happen. Kadalik. Look, it's just going to happen that way. And they say to her that your Lord is Hakim wa Alim. He's most wise and most knowledgeable. Usually it's Alim wa Hakim. It's most knowledgeable, most wise, but it's switched around because the scholars say she wasn't questioning the knowledge of Allah. She's questioning the wisdom of why this is happening now. Why now, after all these years, Hajar comes into the picture, then she's left behind with Ismail. Why now? Look, it's, that's the way it goes. Now notice, Ibrahim السلام, didn't do anything, right? At the most, the narration says, he said, Alhamdulillah, he praised Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he thanked Allah. But there is no flipping out like, oh my God, I got the news of a kid. Yes, finally, this is happening. None of that. Nor is there, how is this happening? Why is this happening? He's watching his wife argue with Jibreel alayhi salam over why this is happening. Ibrahim is, is calm. And how calm is he? He notices something that you really wouldn't notice in a moment of shock like that. He says, yeah, but ma khatbukum ayyuhal mursalun. That's nice, but what are you angels really up to? Because Ibrahim recognized that if this was a bushra of a child, if this was the glad tidings of a child, it would have just been Jibreel. 
What are the angel of death? What's the angel of death doing here? And what's the other angel doing here? Why the other angels? Now Al Qurtubi rahimahullah he says something beautiful here. He actually noted why Ibrahim Islam did not say anything or did not flip out and, and, and you know lose it. He says that Ibrahim alayhi salam ta'awada ala al-ajab. He was used to strange things happening to him in life. You know those people that sit on roller coasters and nothing phases them, right? They've been on every roller coaster in life anyway, right? Ibrahim has been thrown into a fire and it didn't burn him, right? He was to slaughter his son and his son turned into a ram. He's seen so much in his life that he has this tawakkul in Allah, this trust in Allah, that you know what? It is what it is, alhamdulillah. And he was used to it. So he simply says, ما خطبكم أيها المرسلون? Yeah, but what are you really up to? And they said, إِنَّا أُرْسِدْنَا إِلَىٰ قَوْمٍ مُجْرِمِينَ We have been sent to a transgressing people. We have been sent to the people of Lut alayhi salam. Lut, his nephew, the only person that believed in the Prophet that believed in the Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, aside from his wife, who went out and subhanAllah, I mean, he's like Ali radiallahu anhu was when the Prophet called out to his people and he said, I'll support you, Ya Rasulullah. Lut supported Ibrahim very early on and he grew in his own ambitions and he went out to do da'wah in another town nearby. So when Ibrahim heard that, that they were sent to the people of Lut, what did he do? He Forget about the child right now. He started arguing with the angels on behalf of Lut Islam, and they said what? Look, we know Lut is there. We know the believers are there. They're going to be fine. It's those that have transgressed and those that have oppressed. A beautiful uh, lesson we take from this, by the way, as well. Notice that on the way to destroy a nation, they just gave the glad tidings to Ibrahim alayhi salam of a child that's going to produce nations, one of the largest nations on earth, Bani Israel, right? And in that, as Ibn al-Qayyim says, وَإِن تَتَوَلَّوْا يَسْتَبْدِ الْقَوْمٍ غَيْرَكُمْ If you turn away, Allah replaces you. The irony, they're on their way to do away with a nation, and they're giving the glad tidings of one child that's going to produce one of the largest nations on earth. SubhanAllah, a nation of prophets, a nation of anbiya, and so on and so forth, okay? So he plays that role with Ibrahim alayhi salam. Finally, when Ibrahim and Ismail finished building the Kaaba, and Ibrahim said, Arina manasikana. Oh Allah, show us the rituals. The Prophet ﷺ said, Allah sent Jibreel alayhi salam, and Jibreel alayhi salam did the Hajj with Ibrahim. Step by step, he took him through the manasik of Hajj. Right? He walked him through it. The same Hajj that you do, the same Hajj that was revived by the Prophet ﷺ, he walked him through it. And one shaitan tempted him from the places where the Jamarat are today, Jibreel is the one who told Ibrahim to throw stones at him. And we do that today in commemoration of that moment that Jibreel told Ibrahim, throw those stones at Shaitan. So SubhanAllah, look at that tradition, look at that rich legacy that we have from that moment, that Jibreel is the one who taught Ibrahim the Hajj in the first place. Now sometimes the mention of Jibreel alayhi salam is not as prominent, not as pronounced. So for example, in the story of Yusuf, do you ever associate Yusuf alayhi salam with Jibreel alayhi salam? You don't, I mean, you don't see, you could listen to an entire series on Yusuf alayhi salam and Jibreel never comes into the picture. But he is there, right? And you know, one of the scholars he pointed out, he said, SubhanAllah, if you look at even the way that Allah describes Yusuf, this is a tafsir tidbit that I can't go into detail with. Allah says about Musa alayhi salam, فَلَمَّا بَلَغَ أَشُدَّهُ وَاسْتَوَى آتَيْنَاهُ حُكْمًا وَعِلْمًا that when Moses, peace be upon him, reached his age of maturity, was stawa, which according to most of the scholars is Arba'een, 40 years old, meaning at that moment, that's when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him uh, knowledge and wisdom. Okay, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him those things done. His prophethood started when he was at that stage of maturity. Yusuf alayhi salam, the ayah says, فَلَمَّا بَلَغَ أَشُدَّهُ آتَيْنَاهُ حُكْمًا وَعِلْمًا When he reached his age of maturity, we gave him uh, wisdom and knowledge to show that Yusuf's prophethood started at a much earlier age. His journey with Allah and with Jibreel alayhi salam starts at a much earlier age. Where is his first encounter with Jibreel? You know where it is? When his brothers threw him into that well and Yusuf alayhi salam went plunging to the bottom, he landed in the hands of a man that he's never seen before. Jibreel alayhi salam. Jibreel caught him to make sure that the fall was not too, too harsh on him. And subhanAllah, you think about that, Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, he comments on that, in that is a sign that the creation never catches the ropes except that the Creator catches you. لا يضيعك الله. Allah does not lose you, Allah does not let you go to waste. From the moment his brothers cut the ropes, he was caught. Whether Jibreel even spoke to him at that point, whether that's the meaning of فَأَوْحَيْنَا إِلَيْهِ لَتُنَبِّئَنَّهُمْ بِأَمْرِهِمْ هَذَا that you will one day, that we revealed to him that you will one day 
uh, you know, uh, inform them of this affair and you will one day, this will one day come back to them. Whether that's the meaning of it or wahi was just inspiration here, Allahu alam, it seems to be the latter, but still Jibreel caught Yusuf alayhi salam. So sometimes it's very subtle. Though you don't hear it prominently being mentioned, that's a pretty significant role that Yusuf did not go crashing to the ground. Instead, Allah sent Jibreel to catch him. Sometimes you see the mention of Jibreel not necessarily with the prophet that's being spoken about in the story, but with the enemy of that particular prophet. So with Musa alayhi salam. Now realize, Waraqa said, this is the angel that was sent to Musa alayhi salam. And there are multiple reasons for that. One of them that the Prophet ﷺ would challenge a tyrant, a Fir'aun in his own ummah, Abu Jahl and Abu Lahab, and would challenge a, a regime, he would challenge a system of oppression, the politics of that time. Just like Musa salam did. This wasn't about theology, this was about replacing a system of corruption. And when you do that, you're going to be turned out, just like Musa salam was. Another one, Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah says, out of all of the prophets and messengers, Musa received the most extensive revelation, the Torah and its origin was the most extensive. It was the greatest revealed in the sense of volume of any book that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had ever revealed to a messenger. The Quran was made easy for memorization. It is not as thick as the Torah was. All right. So obviously Jibreel taught Musa a lot. He was with Musa a lot. But the most, you know, the narration that we see an authentic mention of Jibreel in the story of Musa is actually with his enemy. It's with Fir'aun. And it's an authentic hadith in a tirmidhi that Jibreel came to the Prophet ﷺ and he told the Prophet ﷺ, you should have seen me the day that Fir'aun died. Now why would Jibreel even be telling him this? Is it to, you know, like, you want to know what I did to Fir'aun the day he died? No, it's to show the Prophet ﷺ, like, look, Abu Jahad is a mini Fir'aun. Wait to see what happens to him. And Abu Lahab, don't worry, you should have seen me the day Fir'aun died. Prophet ﷺ said, what happens? Jibreel said, as he was drowning in the bottom of the sea, he said, I went and I found him and I started kicking dirt into his mouth. Said, because I was afraid that he would say, La ilaha illallah, that he would repent and Allah would have mercy on him. Who does this hadith tell you about more than Jibreel? Allah. Right? Who knows Allah better than Jibreel? And Jibreel knows that Allah is so merciful that even Fir'aun has a chance. And he was afraid that with that one moment of repentance, Allah would void all of those years of corruption and tyranny. And by the way, you know, I know that you know, we like to compare modern day dictators to Fir'aun, rightfully so, but Fir'aun is the worst. Right? You've got to understand that. You know, I know, and this is the consensus of the scholars, right? that Fir'aun is the worst human being. I mean, he combines all of the worst qualities in a person that's ever been created you know, uh, through mankind. He's here. Right, and he's the worst of them all. And a lot of times people say, well, this dictator is worse than Fir'aun. No, he's not worse than Fir'aun. Sisters come up and they're like, my husband's worse than Fir'aun. And I'm like, a sister once told me that before and I was like, dude, your husband's gonna cut you up into pieces. You better run away. If, if your husband's worse than Fir'aun, number one, you need a divorce. Number two, you better be scared, right? Your husband's not worse than Fir'aun. No tyrant's worse than Fir'aun. Jibreel is worried that Fir'aun has a chance with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, did Jibreel ruin his fate? Did Jibreel mess it up for him? No, Allah told Jibreel after that, Ya Jibreel, wa izzati wa jalali. I swear by my glory and my honor that لو استغاثني واستغفرني غفرت له. If he would have sought forgiveness from me sincerely, I still would have forgiven him. Your putting dirt in his mouth would not have stopped it. Okay, I still would have forgiven him. Now here's the thing. You might think, well, why the dirt in the mouth? When wicked people die anyway, the malaika do what? The angels do what? Yadribuna wujuhum. They're hitting them in the face. Jibreel just gave an extra kick to Fir'aun. Like he really hated Fir'aun. Why did Jibreel hate Fir'aun so much? Was it because Fir'aun dissed Jibreel one day when he was talking to Musa Islam, like you and that angel that comes to you? Is that why? No. Listen to what he says to the Prophet. He said, Abghatuhu yawma sami'tuhu yaqul ana rabbukum al a'la. I hated him the day I heard him say, I am your Lord the Most High. When Fir'aun had the audacity to stand up and say, I am your Lord the Most High, the, the hatred that Jibreel developed for Fir'aun was unprecedented. And subhanAllah, that shows you something about Jibreel. And in hadith literature, sometimes when Jibreel came to the Prophet ﷺ, he did not say Allah says, he said Al-A'la, the Most High says, the Most High has done. Which shows the status or, 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 or the regard that Jibreel shows for his Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. So sometimes, we see it that way. Lastly, with the family of Imran, sometimes you see it not necessarily with the Prophet, 
but with the family of prophethood. Now we know the story of Maryam alayhi salam when Maryam was worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in her mihrab, in her area in the masjid and Zakariya alayhi salam would come and visit her. Every time he got in there, he found fruits, he found food that was out of, out of season and he doesn't know where this is coming from, right? Ya Maryam, where are you getting this from? Look, it's from Allah. Allah gives what He wills to whom He wills when He wills. Okay? What happened there? Zakaria started to call upon his Lord at that moment and he starts to call upon Allah, showing his weaknesses and things of that sort. What does Allah say happened? The angels actually cut him off here. And Jibreel is the one who gives the bushra. Jibreel is the one who gives the glad tidings. In Allah yubashiruka bi Yahya, Allah gives you the glad tidings of a son. Not only that, he's already been named. He has this quality, that quality, that quality. Allah starts to mention his character, his qualities. Zakaria says, "Wait, how is this happening? Anna yakunu li walad, wa mraati aqir, wa qad balaghni al kibr, wa mraati aqir. How am I supposed to have a child when I'm old and you know my wife is barren? How is this happening? What's the answer?" Kadalik, number one, look, don't ask those types of questions. Allah has decided it. It's going to happen. And Allah creates whatever He wills. Okay? And in Surah Maryam, وَقَدْ خَلَقْتُكَ I created you من قبل before وَلَمْ تَكُوا شَيْئًا You were nothing. Nothing is beyond Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's power. This is what's happened now. You have a child that's going to be born to you. Now Maryam, she goes out. And she goes out where? She would draw us to the east and she would leave that, she would, when she would leave the masjid once a month, she would go out to the east. And many of the scholars, they say that was to appreciate the sunrise. She would go and she would watch the sunrise and she would do her dhikr and remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And she would put up a hijab, a curtain. She'd put two stakes in the ground and she put up a curtain so that even when she was out in the open, it was clearly signified that this is my territory, right? Don't come near. She's a young lady. 14 to 18 years old. You know, that's historically speaking, if you really want to look at it, she's a teenager, right? And she's worshiping Allah alone, remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. And what does Allah say? فَأَرْسَلْنَا إِلَيْهَا رُوحَنَا We sent to her none other than our spirits. We didn't send to her any angel. We sent to her our Jibreel alayhi salam. فَتَمَثَّلَ لَهَا بَشَرًا سَوِيَّا Jibreel appeared to her like a completely proportional, beautiful human being. You know, they measure beauty scientifically through what? Symmetry, right? Allah says, Basharan sawiya, a, 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 a completely symmetrical human being. Jibreel was perfect in every sense. He appears in the form of a young man. Now does Maryam look at this young man, at Tahira, this woman of purity and whatever it is, and modesty, and say, oh man, assalamu alaikum. You know, what a beautiful oh God, you know? <laughs> I can't believe he's here right now. I don't know who you are, but I'm sorry. You know, I'm worshiping Allah. Can I finish worshiping Allah? Then I'll come talk to you. She doesn't do all that. What does she do? Before Jibreel could even open his mouth, she says, I seek refuge in the most merciful from you if you have any fear of Allah. I mean, if you have any decency inside of you, turn around and go away and let's not even talk. Let's pretend this never happened for it. Just go seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So sisters, if a brother approaches you in the hallway, try that with them, all right? Watch what happens. Even if he doesn't understand Arabic, he's gonna be like, all right, I'm not touching that sister, you know? <laughs> but seriously, go back to that story and you wonder, well, why did Maryam start talking to Jibreel after that? If she just told him, go away, and I don't wanna talk to you, and if you have any decency inside of you, just let's pretend this never happened. You know why? Because when she answered Jibreel with that statement, Jibreel alayhi salam assumed an angelic form. Jibreel Islam, in Tafada Jibreel, he left his human form and he assumed, not his full angelic form, we said this, he assumed an angelic form, a light with a voice, whatever it may be, and he continued the conversation with her. Innama ana rasulu rabbiki bi ahabalaki gulaman zakiya. I am a messenger of your Lord that's, been, that's come to you to give you the glad tidings of a pure son. When she starts to argue and says, Anna yakunu li gulam, you know, how am I supposed to have a son or how am I supposed to have a child? Right? I've never even been touched by a man. I've never been impure. The answer is what? Allah has decided. It's already done. Kadalik. All right? And Allah and, and He gives her, you know, He will be a sign for the people and a mercy from us. 
And look, this is already happening. Qada means the execution of the decree, the execution of Qadr. Kana amran maqdiya means what? You're already pregnant. It starts now. <laughs> this is not from the future. It starts now. Fahamalatu, she conceived him. Fantabadat bihi makanan qasiya. She hides away from her people for a time and she and she stays away from them as the pregnancy develops. When the pregnancy starts to get to a point where she's going to deliver, realize she's a young girl. She doesn't have anyone around her to help her. She's never experienced pregnancy before. When she's driven to the trunk of the tree, what does she say? Ya laytani mittu qabla hadha wa kuntu nasiyan mansiya. I wish I would have died before this and been completely forgotten. Now the ulama say the part about wanting to die, right? Because some of you say, well, can you ask Allah that you want to die? Actually, the Prophet said, if you're dying, you can ask Allah and you'ajjil Allah. A believer can ask Allah to speed it up. That's permissible. And they say that since Maryam never experienced pregnancy and pregnancy delivery pushes a woman and the women are like, yeah, we know, right? <laughs> we have no idea, right? We just see how women are when they're giving birth, okay? Since pregnancy delivery pushes a woman to the brink of death, Maryam actually thought she was dying. That's one way of looking at it, that she was in so much pain, she thought she was dying. When she says, Kuntu nasyan mansiya, I wish I was completely forgotten. Why is she saying that? Because, you know, people are going to mock the people of Iman, they're going to mock the people of faith, this, they're going to mock a family of prophethood, they're going to say, look at what she was, look at what she was like, you know. So Maryam calls out, just wishing she never existed. Who starts to talk to her? Nadaha min tahtiha alla tahzani. Jibreel says to her, don't you dare grieve, don't be sad, alla tahzani. He starts coaching her through her pregnancy. You know, you think that you want to, you think that you will have a, a disgraceful mention. Actually, there's a revelation that's coming that's going to say, make mention in the book of Maryam. You have, you have something awaiting you and you have no idea what Allah is going to make out of you. And look, Allah has placed beneath you a river. Shake the palm tree. Fresh ripe dates will fall upon you. Eat, drink, and rejoice. You know, your, your children, your spouses and your children are supposed to be They're supposed to be the coolness of your eyes. Look at your child, not with, uh, not with a feeling of regret, but with a feeling of happiness. Then the next test comes to her that you're not allowed to defend yourself when your people approach you. But Maryam had full confidence at that point that Allah was with her. So when Maryam approached her people, she didn't know how Allah was going to defend her. She didn't know what Allah was going to do, but she had been coached properly and her tawakkul kicked in here, her trust in Allah that you know what, something is gonna happen and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewarded her with that. That's when Isa alayhi salam spoke in her defense. So Jibreel assumes here now, pregnancy coach with Maryam alayhi salam. He coaches her through her pregnancy, reassures her, reaffirms her. And finally, before we break for Asr, with Isa alayhi salam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions numerous, Allah azza just says, أَيَّدْنَاهُ بِرُوحِ الْقُدُسِ We supported him with the Holy Spirit. And Allah even mentions it as a favor to Isa alayhi salam. أَيَّتُكَ I supported you with Ruh al-Qudus, with the Holy Spirit. I can't go into detail with that meaning, but Obviously, Isa alayhi salam was supported by Jibreel alayhi salam throughout his life. Not only that, the scholars say the only angel that could take a prophet and ascend and descend through the heavens is who? Jibreel. So when the plot was made to crucify him, the angel that was sent to him to take him through the heavens and to place him there until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees that he returns was Jibreel alayhi salam. Okay? And that's why, subhanAllah, you know, I kept looking for the meaning of why Allah chooses to mention in Surah Maryam, وَمَا نَتَنَزَّلُ إِلَّا بِأَمْرِ رَبِّكَ That we do not come down except with the permission of your Lord. What is that ayah? The Prophet ﷺ would grieve when Jibreel did not visit him for a long time. And Jibreel alayhi salam tells the Prophet ﷺ, look, we only come to you when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees. We can't come when we decree on our own. Okay, we don't make that decision. And it's made very personal, like it's Jibreel speaking. We don't come unless your Lord decrees. Why in Surah Maryam? Many of the scholars mentioned because Jibreel played a prominent role in every single prophet that's been mentioned there. Think about it, Zakariyah, Maryam. Then it went to Isa. Then it went to Ibrahim, right? Then it went to Musa. Then it went to Idris. Then it went to Ismail. All of these people, Jibreel played a very prominent role in their lives. And so it said to the Prophet, look, 
We only come down when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees and it's with wisdom. And when Jibreel comes down, you will be fulfilled and you will be satisfied. Inshallah ta'ala, the rest of the seminar is Jibreel with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulihi al-kareem, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. So the rest of the seminar, Jibreel with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And to properly understand this, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, waliyi min al-malaika Jibreel. And it's hard, to, it's difficult to translate wali in the context of an angel because, you know, it's not our traditional guardian angel, but the, 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 the angel that was closest to the Prophet ﷺ, the one who supported the Prophet ﷺ, his protective friend from the angels is Jibreel alayhi salam. And the Prophet ﷺ, he also says in another narration, he says, مَا بِن نَبِيًّا إِلَّا لَهُ وَزِيرَانِ مِنْ أَهْلِ السَّمَاءِ وَزِيرَانِ مِنْ أَهْلِ الْأَرْضِ There is no prophet except that Allah gives him two ministers from the inhabitants of the earth and two ministers from the inhabitants of the heavens. He says, وَزِرَايَ مِنْ أَهْلِ السَّمَاءِ My two inhabitants from the heavens are Jibreel and Mikal. My two ministers from the inhabitants of the heavens are Jibreel and Mikal. وَوَزِرَايَ And my two ministers مِنْ أَهْلِ الْأَرْضِ From the inhabitants of the earth are Abu Bakr and Umar رضي الله تعالى عنهما. So Mikal also plays a role in the life of the Prophet ﷺ. We see some, some mentions of Mikal that we're going to see here as well. But obviously, Jibreel is the closest of them all. Now, how does the first encounter of the Prophet ﷺ and Jibreel go? Does anyone know? Is it Hira? When does the Prophet ﷺ first see Jibreel? As a young child. Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu narrates that the Prophet ﷺ was running around playing with all of the children just like everyone else. And this is the year that his mother died. So the Prophet ﷺ is a complete orphan at this point. He's lost his mother. And he's lost his father sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he's now switching from hand to hand. I mean, from lap to lap. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam still was a very happy child. And he's running around playing with all the other kids. When suddenly a man came and he grabbed Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he threw him into the ground. So all of the other children went running to their parents. And they said, Inna Muhammadan qad qutil. That Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has been killed. And as they're running to their parents, the Prophet ﷺ is watching now what this man is about to do to him. Rasulullah ﷺ said, he cut my chest. He opened my chest. He grabbed the heart of the Prophet ﷺ. And he took something from the heart of the Prophet ﷺ and he said, هَذَا حَظُّ الشَّيْطَانِ منك. This is the portion of evil within you, the portion of the devil within you. And he threw it. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, he proceeded to wash my heart in a golden vessel of zamzam. And subhanAllah, the, the, what the scholars say about that, number one, gold would be considered the best of metals, and zamzam is the water that Jibreel ﷺ opened in the first place. Zamzam is the best of all water. He started to purify the heart of the Prophet ﷺ. He started to wash it with zamzam. And the Prophet ﷺ is watching all of this as a child, and his heart was put back sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, And by the time the kids got back, they found the Prophet ﷺ with his chest sewn up. And you know what's amazing, subhanAllah. Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu said there was a line down the chest of the Prophet ﷺ that had makhit. Makhit is stitching. Like a perfect line of stitching. Did they, did they used to do open heart surgeries 1400 years ago in Arabia? Perfect stitching on a line on the chest of the Prophet ﷺ. And they said his face was blue. The very first time I taught this class, It was in London. There was a cardiologist that came to me and gave me like a 20 minute lecture as to why his face would be blue because circulation's cut off and would it be this color blue? And I'm like, yeah, that's, that's really, and he was doing it, mashallah, you know, in that British accent. I'm like, that's great. So I got the point now. Circulation cut off, blue face. Further proof, right? The Prophet Sallallahu heart was taken out physically and he was purified alayhi salatu was salam. He got absolutely no explanation from that moment. He was traumatized by the incident. He didn't know what happened. Now the mushrikeen, the pagans were a very superstitious people. So they just took this to mean that it's some good omen, right? And they started to celebrate it and so on and so forth. Because they thought that this was something that was good for them. Obviously it wouldn't be so good for them, right? But the point is, no explanation for 34 years. For 34 years the Prophet ﷺ knew that this happened. And we, we know that other miracles happened with them as well وسلم, with no explanation. 34 years later, at the age of 40 years old, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha said, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he started to see a ru'ya, a saliha, 
or الرؤية الصادقة Truthful, righteous dreams. For six months, all of a sudden, the Prophet ﷺ started to see truthful, righteous dreams. Good dreams, truthful dreams. He sees in a dream that something is going to happen tomorrow, that someone's going to come visit him. The next day that person comes and visits him wearing exactly what he saw him in the dream doing. He sees a janazah in his dream. He wakes up in the morning and he finds out that a person has passed away and that janazah takes place. And that continued for six months. Everything that he was seeing in his dream would come true the next night. So he already has an idea that something is happening. Just to sort of understand why the Prophet ﷺ would all of a sudden start going to a cave, right? And meditating and praying, right? Something is very strange is happening with him sallallahu alayhi wasallam as he's seeing these things. It's also been concluded now in his household between him and Khadija radiallahu anha that it's a supernatural experience, that someone is communicating with them from the divine. Some form of creation is communicating with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Now this continues for six months and that's why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he said that good dreams are 146th of revelation because the revelation is 23 years and this was for six months. All right, that's all he got. Then suddenly Aisha radiallahu anha says, Allah bestowed the love of seclusion on the Prophet sallallahu Suddenly he loved to be alone. Rasulullah sallallahu would climb up to Hira. Now Hira is about a two hour climb, right? That's with the zigzag stairs now, right? How many of you have been up to Hira? Not many, but it's a pretty long climb, right? It's a pretty long climb to get up there. They didn't have stairs back then. Hira is not a big cave. You know, and subhanAllah, it's not like this deep cave either. And it's, you know, it would be pretty unidentifiable had we not had the history of Islam, right? I mean, it's way up there. Like Ghar Thawr is very close. You can see Ghar Thawr pretty easily. You can get there pretty easily. Hira is way up there. But if you get up to Hira, you have this aerial view of Mecca. SubhanAllah, you see everything. You see the entire city. You even see the Haram, even with all those hideous buildings around it. You can still see the Kaaba, right? You see everything from there. The Prophet ﷺ would go up there for days, weeks, and then finally the entire month of Ramadan, وَيَتَحَنَّثْ One narration says يَتَحَنَّثْ which is a deen al-Hanifi, the, the monotheistic religion of Ibrahim ﷺ. He worshipped Allah in accordance with the monotheistic religion of Ibrahim ﷺ, which means he just went up there and he prayed in any way that he could. He didn't have an organized salah. He called upon God in an Abrahamic way. That's literally what the narration is saying. But here's the thing, he had no desire to come down. And the beauty of that is that, did the Prophet ﷺ have any issues financially? No, he was actually quite wealthy at that time. Okay, so he wasn't going up there because he was suffering a sudden financial crisis. Was the Prophet ﷺ suffering from slander or a poor mansion in society in any way? Absolutely not. He's as famous as they come. He's a Sadiq al Amin. He's respected, the truthful, the, the truthful one, the trustworthy one. Everyone knows who he is. ﷺ. Everyone admires him and he attained that status not by wealth or by family or lineage because of who he was as a person, right? Did he have issues with his marriage? Because that would drive a person up to a cave, right? <laughs> if he has this, no, clearly not because Khadija radiallahu anha is 15 years older than him. A 55 year old woman climbs up to Hira to bring him food and drink without him even requesting it. She would go up there out of her love for him and take food and drink and, clo and, and clothing to him so that the Prophet ﷺ would not have to interrupt his prayer. And so subhanAllah, she recognizes something special is happening with her husband as well. Suddenly as the Prophet ﷺ is there one day, he sees Jibreel alayhi salam. Now, did Jibreel come to him in the form of an angel? Or in the form of a human being? In the form of a human being. There's a proof for this which I'll mention inshaAllah ta'ala. In the form of a human being. So you might be thinking to yourself, why in the world was the Prophet ﷺ scared then? Well think about it, you're two hours up there, no one's around you, and then all of a sudden you see a strange man standing at the mouth of the cave and he's just staring you down, he's not saying anything. What might you think is happening if you're the Prophet ﷺ? What might you think is happening? Hallucination, dreaming, is it something that I'm seeing, right? I remember subhanAllah, I went to a tarbiyah camp, uh, 2004, it was the year before Katrina and it was in Mexia, Texas. So it was like away from civilization or something like that. And I remember driving after 24 hours of not sleeping and I started seeing polar bears on the highway in Texas. <laughs> that to me was, I was like, okay, hallucination is real, okay? After, after I was, I had to be convinced that they weren't real polar bears on the highway. But, <laughs> you know, you might think something's happening to you, right? 
To add on to that, a future narration gives us an idea of what happened to the Prophet Rasulullah when he told Khadija what happens, he said, Ja'ani alladhi atani fil manam. The one who I was seeing in my dreams came to me. So that further establishes that the Prophet had already seen Jibreel in his dreams. And so he's thinking that this is strange. I'm not sleeping right now. I'm not dreaming, which explains why Jibreel grabbed him. He hugged him. This is real. Iqra, read. Right? Read. You are not hallucinating. This is not a vision. I'm really here. Not only am I really here and I'm squeezing you to show you that. <inaudible> the words that are going to be revealed to you, this revelation that's going to come to you, it's going to be heavy. Right? You need to be ready to acquire this. Iqra. <inaudible> so he commanded him read and he let him go. And the Prophet ﷺ said, I don't know how to read. So Jibreel ﷺ grabbed him again. Harder and said, read, iqra. And he said, I don't know how to read. And Jibreel Islam grabbed me the third time. He said, Islam, he grabbed me the third time and he held me so tight that I thought I was going to die. Jibreel squeezed me and said, iqra, read. So the Prophet Islam said, what shall I read? And that's when Jibreel Islam said, iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. Read in the name of your Lord who creates. Khalaq al insana min alaq who created man from a suspended clot. Iqra wa rabbuk al-akram. Read and your Lord is most generous. The one who taught man that which he knew not, taught man the use of the pen. The Prophet ﷺ, as he receives these words, and that happens, Jibreel didn't grab him again. And Jibreel didn't go anywhere. The Prophet ﷺ left the cave and he went running down. And you can imagine how, you know, subhanAllah, how long that way down must have been after what just happened to him sallallahu alaihi wasallam and you can imagine the sight the, the relief that the prophet sallallahu alaihi felt when he finally got home and he saw khadija radiyallahu ta'ala anha and literally embraced her and hugged her and told her to hold me hold me and khadija radiyallahu anha said what happened now when the prophet sallallahu alaihi told her what happened khadija radiyallahu anha she could have easily been like well maybe you should stop going up to that cave maybe you should stay home more often let's just pretend this never happened you know, you can meditate in the corner of the house and we'll leave you alone. And inshallah, nothing will happen again. She didn't say that. Look at how beautiful Khadija is. SubhanAllah, she truly believed in the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi before he believed in himself. Truly. She tells the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wallahi la yukhzik Allahu abada. Allah would never disgrace you. Now why did she bring Allah into the picture? Because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi was going up there because he was a humanitarian, he's a social justice, I mean he's an activist before being a messenger. He's trying to solve the problems of the world. It's not happening, corruption still exists. You know, he knows there's more to this world. These dreams are happening. He knows that Allah is, you know, that Allah has given him a greater purpose. So what the Prophet Sallallahu is thinking might have just happened is that, you know, a, a, a demon disgraced him or that this is a form of, of punishment or this is a form of trial, like I'm losing my mind and a shaitan is coming to me or something like that. Khadija says, you, wallahi la yukhzik Allah abada. Allah would never disgrace a person like you. And she starts to give us the last 15 years of the seerah of the Prophet rahim. You're a man who establishes the ties of kinship. You're a man who takes care of the orphans and the poor. You're a man who's generous to his guests and to his neighbors. There is no one who has a cause except that you take up their cause. Allah would never disgrace you. Khadija says, let's go to Waraqah. Waraq ibn Nufal, her cousin, her first cousin, and he's a biblical scholar, he was a monotheist, he refused to worship the idols, he was one of the few people that refused to worship the idols, he abandoned paganism at a very young age, and he knew the scriptures. So Khadija says, let's go to him and see what he thinks. So they go to him. And the Prophet ﷺ tells Waraq what he saw. Waraq right away says, Hadha namus. Now realize these people were waiting for Scripture. They were waiting for the, they knew something was about to happen. They knew a messenger was about to come. Waraka made the connection right away. You're the messenger that everyone's been waiting for. That's Jibreel that came to Musa alayhi salam. And he said, I wish I was young enough that I could have lived to see and support you when your people turn you out. And the Prophet was like, what, me? Would they turn me out? Would my people really turn me out? The Prophet has never disappointed or upset anyone. I mean, he's, he's on good terms with everybody. Would they really turn me out? Waraka knows how this goes. When you challenge that system, when you bring this revelation, it's going to cause those who are corrupt to oppress you and to run you out. Now here's the thing, SubhanAllah, this was probably 
uh, the most fascinating moment in all of my research, okay, of this class of Jibreel. Just out of curiosity, I was like, you know what, Waraka is a biblical scholar. How did he make the connection that this is Jibreel? And I know that there are remnants of the Bible, so I, you know, the, the true Bible. So I said, well, let me go through the Bible and see if there's any instance that mentions how Gabriel brings revelation. The one instance I found, the one incident that's there, it's in Daniel 8, the prophet Daniel alayhi salam. Daniel says, behold, I saw a man before me with a booming voice saying, understand. As he touched me and recited the word to me, I fell on my face trembling and lost all strength, but I could still hear his words. Then he stood me upright and said, fear not, O beloved one of God, fear not, peace be unto you. SubhanAllah. I saw that and I, I seriously got goosebumps. That was probably, if there was any moment in research that gave me goosebumps, it was that. How incredibly consistent is that with what the Prophet ﷺ experienced? SubhanAllah. The one instance that, makes, that mentions Jibreel alayhi salam coming to a person with revelation. Now what happens after that? Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she said that the Prophet wasallam after that, there was a fatra, there's a pause in revelation. That pause in revelation was a very long time. Okay, it could have even gotten into years. Allahu alam how long it was, but it was a very, very long time. I mean, you'll find the scholars talk about it. If the Prophet ﷺ was making this experience up, he clearly would have just went to the people and say, hey guys, revelation's coming to me now. Instead, the Prophet ﷺ waits. He waits for this angel to come back. He doesn't get revelation, but here's what he gets next. The Prophet ﷺ starts to walk back into those mountains and Rasulullah ﷺ expresses in his own words that it was like he wanted to throw himself off because he wanted some sort of clarity. What's going on? Every time the Prophet ﷺ would get into those mountains, he would hear the voice of Jibreel ﷺ saying, Ya Muhammad, innaka Rasulullahi haqqan. O Muhammad, you are the messenger of Allah in truth. And that calmed the Prophet ﷺ down and the Prophet ﷺ would go back to his house. Then later on, not only did he say, Ya Muhammad, innaka Rasulullah haqqan, he said, Wa ana Jibreel, and I am Jibreel. So he clarifies to the Prophet ﷺ that he's Jibreel. But still, no Quran, no revelation. What's going on? The next narration I'm about to share with you is probably going to make you all go like, what? Okay? Khadija radiallahu anha once again. And I guarantee you, you'll leave the seminar with a greater appreciation of Khadija radiallahu anha. Khadija comes to the Prophet ﷺ and she says to the Prophet ﷺ, If this companion of yours comes back to you, tell me. So the Prophet ﷺ was waiting. Jibreel ﷺ came. What was the Prophet ﷺ seeing? He was hearing the voice and he was seeing the radiance of Jibreel ﷺ. Khadija anha said, Sit on my right side. So he sat on her right side. Khadija said, Atara, do you see him? The Prophet ﷺ said, Naam, yes. So she told the Prophet ﷺ, sit on my left side. He sat on her left side. She said, Atara, do you see him? The Prophet ﷺ said, yes. Khala'at khimara. She took off her khimar. Now, the hijab back then, there was no legislation of hijab. The women used to wear something on their heads that covered their hair. And it came down, but it didn't necessarily cover this area of their body, their necks, and so on and so forth. So they wore that sort of, it, it was called the khimar, it was called the hijab back then, it was called the khimar back then already. So the narration is khala'at khimara. She took it off, she embraced the Prophet ﷺ from behind him, she put her chin on his shoulder. And, it was, and she was holding him so close that the Prophet ﷺ was almost in her lap. And she said, Atara, do you see him? The Prophet ﷺ said, No. She said, Uthbut fa innahu malak wa laysa bi shaytan. She said, Be firm, that's an angel, that's not a devil. Now you're reading that narration, you're going, What? <laughs> what just happened here? What is she talking about? I'll tell you what happened. Khadija radiallahu anha studied the story of Jibreel. <laughs> Khadija went out and learned about Jibreel alayhi salam. One of the characteristics of Jibreel alayhi salam is his haya, his modesty. Anytime Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, later on even in Sirah, when Aisha radiallahu anha was not fully dressed, Jibreel would not come inside the house. He'd call the Prophet ﷺ out of the house. Khadija figured that out. She went and studied that. She's telling the Prophet ﷺ, if he was, and the Prophet ﷺ doesn't know what's going on either. Atara, do you see him? Do you see him? She's the one telling him, once again, that's an angel that is not a devil. 
finally then the Prophet ﷺ was walking once again. And this time it was not, Ya Muhammad, inna ka Rasulullah haqqan. O oh Muhammad, you're a messenger of Allah in truth. This is the hadith of Jabir in Al-Bukhari that the Prophet ﷺ was walking and suddenly the Prophet ﷺ looked up and he saw Jibreel ﷺ in his full angelic form covering the space between the heavens and the earth, covering the entire horizon. What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? Dhu mirratin fastawa. He rose, alayhi salatu wasalam. Jibreel ﷺ rose to the sky and he covered the entire horizon. The Prophet ﷺ saw him with all of his wings, with his full creation. Not only that, what happened next, right? ثُمَّ دَنَا فَتَدَلَّى He started to come close to the Prophet ﷺ. He was less than two bow lengths away from the Prophet ﷺ, right? He came close to the Prophet ﷺ. And Rasulullah ﷺ fell to the ground. He said that I was so scared that I fell to the ground that he came that close to me. And the Prophet ﷺ went back to his home and he told Khadija radiallahu anha, Zammiruni, Dathiruni, cover me, embrace me. And that's when the next revelation came. Ya ayyuha al-muddathir, qum fa'anthir, wa rabbaka fa'kabbir, wa thiyabaka fa'tahir. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, oh you who is covered up. SubhanAllah, think about it. The first revelation, the Prophet ﷺ was in the cave. The second time, the revelation came to him while he was in the arms of Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha. Wrapped up. Oh, you who is wrapped up, stand up and warn. Stand up and call the people. And declare the greatness of your Lord. Purify your garments. Abandon the idols. Right? This is the first revelation. And subhanAllah, from that moment, Aisha radiallahu anha says, the revelation heated up. Meaning what? After that long pause, after Surah Al-Muddathir, came Surah Al-Muzzammil, came Surah Al-Duha, so on and so forth. There are multiple surahs that started to come very quickly to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that's where it starts. The Prophet ﷺ now understands what is happening. The Prophet ﷺ understands he's a messenger of Allah. The Prophet ﷺ is no longer terrified by the presence of Jibreel ﷺ. It's been made clear to him ﷺ. Now to give you an idea now, what happens when Jibreel comes with a revelation to the Prophet ﷺ? Now we know for the Prophet ﷺ, it was very heavy on him, right? I mean, he would sweat even on a bitterly cold day. It was rough on him. His body would become physically heavier. <laughs> I mean, Zayd ibn Thabit says, my leg was under his leg when the Quran came to him one time and I lost feeling in my leg. You know, Rasulullah was sitting on a camel when Surah Al-An'am was revealed to him and the knees of the camel buckled. And the Prophet got off as a, as a mercy to that camel. So it was visibly, it was vis visibly rough on the Prophet when revelation came to him that way. But how does the process go? Okay, and this is truly fascinating. We know, لو أنزلنا هذا القرآن على جبل لرأيته خاشعا متصديعا من خشية الله. Allah says, if we were to reveal this Quran onto a mountain, you would have seen that mountain crumble. You would see it shake and crumble out of its awe of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. It has to come to the heart of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. He has to bear that revelation. But how does this all happen? Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم was asked, how does the revelation come? The Prophet ﷺ, he said that when Allah desires to speak the words of revelation, when Allah wills to speak the words of revelation, he says there is a loud noise through the heavens. And he said it's like chains pulling over Mount Safa. Like, I mean, imagine the severity of chains pulling over a mountain. And he said the angels of the heavens are overtaken by it. They're overtaken by it. And Allah speaks to Jibreel ﷺ. Now, can you imagine Allah speaks to Jibreel directly with the revelation. Jibreel actually gets the Qur'an from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He hears the revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala finishes with the revelation to Jibreel alayhi salam, the angels regain themselves. And as Jibreel starts to descend, the Prophet sallallahu said, the angels surround Jibreel and they say, Mada qala rabbuk? What did your Lord say? And Jibreel says, Al-Haqq, Al-Haqq, wa huwa al kabir he spoke in the truth, and he is the most high and the most great. The Prophet ﷺ said all of those angels start to say, Al-Haqq, Al-Haqq, wa huwa al-Ali al-Kabir, the truth, the truth. He is the most high and the most great, and they start to descend with Jibreel ﷺ as he brings the revelation down. And in Surah Al-An'am, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned, Surah Al-An'am of course came in one shot, over 20 pages in one shot to the Prophet ﷺ. 70,000 angels were escorting Surah Al-An'am, glorifying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and declaring His praise. 
as it came to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's the process of that revelation coming to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Not only that, dear brothers and sisters, but you know when you recite Qur'an, that's the, the easiest way to get angels to surround you is to start reading Qur'an. You know why? Because the angels have not been given the gift of the recitation of the Qur'an. And some of you are like, wait, what? The angels do not recite the Qur'an. يَسْتَمِعُونَ إِلَيْهِ They listen to it. There are only a few angels that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has actually given the gift of the recitation of it. Obviously, Jibreel alayhi salam and some angels, but for the most part, the angels, they listen to it. So when you start to recite Qur'an in the Qur'an al-Fajr, kana mashhuda. The angels witness that. The angels surround the people as they recite the Qur'an because they love to hear it since they don't recite it, subhanAllah. So that's how the revelation comes to the Prophet ﷺ. Obviously there are numerous ways as to how Jibreel would teach the Prophet ﷺ. And even subhanAllah, as Jibreel taught the Prophet ﷺ, Al-Ahruf, the multiple ways of recitation, the seven ways of recitation. Why? Because, you know, because the Prophet ﷺ, by reciting those seven ways of recitation, people would enter Islam very quickly because the different dialects were included in the recitation, all of them were divine. How did that happen? The Prophet ﷺ says in the hadith in Abu Dawood that Jibreel came to me and told me recite the Qur'an in the recitation that's been given to you. So he said, I started to read. He said, Jibreel was on my right side, Mikael was on my left, tie, left side. Mikael said, istazidhu, increase him. So Jibreel taught me another recitation. Mikael looked at Jibreel again and said, istazidhu, increase him. So he taught me another recitation. Mikal said, istazidhu, increase him, until he said it seven times and the Prophet ﷺ was given seven different modes of recitation of the Qur'an. That's how it comes down to the Prophet ﷺ, that's how it was taught to him. And it's truly miraculous and magnificent that the Prophet ﷺ was able to bear that and remember it by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now what are some other ways that Jibreel came to the Prophet ﷺ? He did not stop coming to him in his dreams. So just because he was now manifesting himself, with revelation, it does not mean that he stopped coming in his dreams. There are some other ways. In his dreams, he'd come to the Prophet ﷺ sometimes with Mikal. So sometimes the Prophet ﷺ saw Jibreel and Mikal together. One time he sees him and Jibreel and Mikal take him and they show him the punishment and the rewards of the grave. So the long hadith of Adab al-Qabr, the punishment of the grave and the rewards of the grave, are Jibreel and Mikal pointing out to the Prophet ﷺ what is happening. Then he showed him Al-Jannah, paradise, and hellfire. And the Prophet ﷺ was shown his home in paradise. He actually saw his house in paradise. So the Prophet ﷺ said, at that point I said to Jibreel and Mikal, Da'ani atkhulu manzili. Leave me now to enter my house, I don't want to go back. Let me get in now. And Jibreel ﷺ, he put his, ha his hand on the arm of the Prophet ﷺ and he said, you still got some time in this world and then you will enter it inshaAllah. Okay, another time the Prophet ﷺ said, I saw in my dream Jibreel and Mikal, and Mikal said to Jibreel, give him an analogy, give him a method. So Jibreel ﷺ, he said the analogy of the message or the parable of the message that has been given to you, Ya Rasulullah, is that of a, of a king who conquered a land. When the king conquered, conquered that land, he built a house in that land. And then when he built that house, he constructed that house, he spread a table spread with food on it. And he invited whoever wanted to come into that home. Jibreel alayhi salam said, Allah is the king. The land is Islam. The home is Jannah. The food is the food of Al-Jannah. Wa anta ya Muhammad Rasulullah. And you, O Muhammad, are the messenger of Allah. Whoever responds to you has entered into Jannah and will eat whatever they desire of it. So Jibreel and Mikal are explaining to the Prophet ﷺ who he is and actually giving him amthal of what he represents and what his message represents. Other times Jibreel ﷺ came to the Prophet ﷺ with a command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his dream. So the Prophet ﷺ saw an image of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. Jibreel alayhi salam showed the Prophet ﷺ Aisha for three consecutive nights. And he told the Prophet ﷺ, هَذِهِ زَوْجَتُكَ فِي الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ This is your wife in this world and the next. And Aisha, she used to boast. She used to say, Jibreel proposed on my behalf. Like who else has that distinction? Jibreel came and asked for my hand, right? <laughs> SubhanAllah, Jibreel proposed on her behalf. Sometimes Jibreel just showed him Jannah, random scenes of Jannah. So one time the Prophet said, Jibreel came to me and he took me to a palace in paradise. It was so beautiful that the Prophet was about to go in 
As he was about to go in, Jibreel said, actually, that's Umar bin Khattab's house. <laughs> so the Prophet ﷺ said, I did not go in because I remembered how jealous of a man Umar is. So I just stayed back. And he narrated the dream the next day and Umar was there and Umar felt bad that Rasulullah was too shy to enter his house in Jannah. Like Umar was over the excitement of having a palace in Jannah. Like, Ya Rasulullah, like, you think I would stop you from coming into my house in Jannah? <laughs> Rasulullah he also says, Atani Jibreel, Jibreel came to me and he took me by my hand and he showed me the gate of my ummah that will enter, or the gate of Jannah that my ummah will enter through. So the Prophet as he's narrating that dream, Abu Bakr starts crying now. Rasulullah said, why are you crying? He said, Ya Rasulullah, I wish I could have been with you to see that. Rasulullah grabbed the hand of Abu Bakr and he said, Ya Abu Bakr, you and I will enter Jannah like this. You're good. It shows you where the Sahaba were as well. They weren't like, what did it look like? What happened here? They were concerned about themselves. They were concerned about their salvation. They were concerned about pleasing Allah and the Messenger wasallam. So the dreams continued. Okay. Now in real life, in what other way did Jibreel come to the Prophet ﷺ other than revelation? Jibreel ﷺ, you have to understand, taught the Prophet ﷺ the sunnah. Okay? وَمَا يَنْتِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَى The Prophet ﷺ doesn't speak out of empty desire. So Hassan ibn Atiyah عنه, says, كَانَ جِبْرِيلْ يَنْزِلُ بِالسُنَّةِ عَلَى النَّبِيِّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ فَيُعَلِّمُهُ إِيَّاهَ كَمَا يُعَلِّمُهُ بِالْقُرْآنِ Jibreel used to come to the Prophet ﷺ and teach him the sunnah the same way that he used to teach him the Qur'an. So every hadith that you hear is from Jibreel ﷺ teaching the Prophet ﷺ as well. So he still teaches him the sunnah. Not only that, he stands with the Prophet ﷺ and he even qualifies statements of the Prophet ﷺ. So Abdullah ibn Abi Qatada radiallahu anhu says, before the battle of Badr, the Prophet ﷺ was, was speaking to us. He was giving us a sermon. And we said to Rasulullah ﷺ, Ya Rasulullah, if we go out in Badr and we lose everything, and you know, we die in that situation. Will we be forgiven for all of our sins? The Prophet ﷺ said, Naam, yes. As soon as he said it, he said, Hada Jibreel. This is Jibreel. Yaqulu illa an yakuna alayka dayn. He says, Unless you have a debt to pay, you've got to pay your debt first. One time the Prophet ﷺ was with the companions in the masjid. Suddenly he took his shoes off to pray. Now realize the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ was dirt. Don't go walking into some masjid now with your shoes and be like, hey, it's sunnah. It was dirt. Okay? So yeah, they wore their shoes when they prayed. Rasulullah took off his shoes and started to pray. When he finished praying, he, he realized all the Sahaba took their shoes off. So the Prophet said, why did you all take your shoes off? They said, we saw you take your shoes off. So the Prophet said, the only reason I did that is, just, is because right before the prayer, Jibreel came to me and told me I stepped in something. That he stepped in some najasa, some impurity. So Jibreel is with the Prophet on quite a frequent basis. And even when people ask the Prophet ﷺ questions, Jibreel answers those questions for the Prophet ﷺ rapidly. Not just any questions. Hussein ibn Salam, the chief rabbi in Medina, he comes to the Prophet ﷺ with some questions. When he asked the Prophet ﷺ these questions, the Prophet ﷺ responded, خَبَرَنِي بِهِنَّ أَنِفًا Jibreel. Jibreel just gave me the answers. Which is why Allah tested the Messenger ﷺ with what? In Surah Al-Kahf. To teach him to say, Allah. When Allah wills, because the Prophet ﷺ became accustomed to getting asked the question, Jibreel gives him the answer. So the Prophet ﷺ was taught that it comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And finally, in this regard, uh, Hadith Jibreel. When I told uh, my mashayikh, when I told my teachers that I was going to teach Jibreel, they were like, oh, mashallah, Hadith Jibreel. I'm like, no, Jibreel. Like, Seerah Jibreel. They're like, Who what are you talking about? There's no book. There's, what are you, why would you teach the Seerah of Jibreel? I'm like, well, it's different. Because Hadith Jibreel, is the first hadith you learn when you study. It really is. It's the most important hadith in Islam. It is by consensus of the scholars, the most important hadith of Islam. It's been narrated by multiple companions with greater context from some of the narrations. The most detailed one is from Abu Dhar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Abu Dhar says, we used to sit with the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa and when someone came from outside, they didn't know who amongst us was the Prophet of God. Why? He dressed like we dressed. He sat on the ground like we sat on the ground. He distinguished himself only by his manners. Even when the Prophet ﷺ did the hijrah, when he migrated to Medina, the Ansar didn't know which one was the Prophet ﷺ. Was it him or Abu Bakr? So they're just waiting to see some form of indication as to which one's the Prophet ﷺ. So Abu Bakr took something, a cloth, and he did this. So they all charged the Prophet ﷺ. 
They didn't know who, how, who he was when they came. So outsiders would come expecting to see this powerful man, right, that's sitting on a throne while everyone else sits on the ground. They just saw him sitting with everyone else on the ground. So Abu Dhar says, we insisted the Prophet sits on a chair. He refused. Then Abu Dhar says, what we did instead was we pushed the dirt together until we made a mound so that he's still sitting on the ground. But at least when someone comes from outside, they know who he is. He said, the Prophet accepted that. When we did that, Abu Dhar says, one day we were sitting and he said, we used to wait for people to come and ask the Prophet some questions that we were too shy to ask him and we would listen to the answers. So one day we're sitting and suddenly a man appears. And this is how he describes him. He says his thobe was extremely white, not wrinkled. And you know, having an extremely white thobe while walking in the desert of Arabia is a pretty tough task, okay? No wrinkles, no dirt on it. His hair was exceedingly black. And he said that he smelled amazing. He had the best smell that we'd ever seen. And he said the per most perplexing thing about this man he wasn't a resident because he didn't live amongst us, but he had no signs of travel on him. I mean, he, he looked as fresh as they come. You know, they didn't have first class travel back then. You don't get off a plane and look fresh if you come off of first class and look miserable if you come off of coach, right? This is the desert of Arabia. So like, we're looking at this guy, no bags under his eyes. He looks, he looks really, really clean, really, really good. And we have no idea who he is. And Abu Dhar says he resembled Dihya. So it shows you that he didn't look exactly like Dihya from close up. He wasn't Dihya, he resembled Dihya. Radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So then Abu Dhar says, the man came and he stopped at the entrance. And he said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Assalamu alayka ya Muhammad. Peace be unto you, O Muhammad. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, Wa alaykum as -salam. He said, Adnu ya Muhammad. Do I have permission to come close to you, O Muhammad? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, sure. Now, they weren't used to this as well because most of the people that came and asked the Prophet some questions were Bedouins. They didn't have any, they just walked right in, sat in front of the Prophet and started asking him questions. So the adab was also flawless, the manners, like, Adnu ya Muhammad, should I come close? The Prophet said, yes. Jibreel came close, he said, should I come closer? The Prophet said, yes. Until Jibreel was sitting right in front of the Prophet and he put his hands on the knees of the Prophet. Abu Dhar says the Sahaba huddled around. What's gonna happen here? What's he gonna ask? So, the, so Jibreel says to the Prophet Ya Muhammad, akhbirni an al-Islam. Oh Muhammad, tell me about Islam. So the Prophet gives him the pride pillars of Islam, that you bear witness that there's no God but Allah, and Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, that you establish the prayer, that you pay the zakah, that you fast Ramadan, and do hajj if you're capable of doing hajj, okay? Now here's the thing, the man says, sadaqt, you've told the truth. Abu Dhar says, we all looked around at each other, like we were like, who do you think you are to say sadaq to the Prophet You've told the truth. What is the arrogance? Like we thought this man had good manners, right? He says to the Prophet you're right, you've told the truth. Then he says, akhbirni an al-iman. Tell me about faith. The Prophet said to believe in Allah, to believe in the angels. SubhanAllah, it's Jibreel sitting in front of him. To believe in the messengers, the messages, the day of judgment and divine decree. He says, sadaq, you've told the truth. He said, akhbirni an al-ihsan. Tell me about excellence. The Prophet said, and ta'budullah ka'annaka tara, that you worship Allah as if you can worship Him. And when you realize, or as if you can see Him, you worship Allah as if you can see Him. And when you realize you can't see Him, then you know that He sees you. He says, sadaqt. Then he asks the Prophet the frequently most asked question in the seerah. Mata sa'a? Akhbirni an sa'a? When is the hour? This is the frequently most asked question to the Prophet Everyone wanted to know when the Day of Judgment was. Not, not because, not the same reason that Idris wanted to know when he would die, right? They just wanted, the mushrikeen, the disbelievers would ask the Prophet mockingly, but with a hint of truth, like when's the Day of Judgment? When are we gonna die, right? So Bedouins would interrupt the Prophet sometimes even in his khutbah, and ask the Prophet Meta sa'a, when is the hour? And the Prophet he always gave a productive answer. So he would say in one narration, ماذا عدت لها? What have you prepared for it? Another narration, ماذا قدمت لها? The same thing, what have you put forth for it? Another narration, he said, look, by the time your son has gray hair, you would have already faced your resurrection. So even if the day of judgment doesn't come, death will already come to you. Your resurrection has started as far as you're concerned anyway. But when Jibreel asked him that, what did the Prophet do? He put his head down. So Abu Dhar says we were confused. To make it even more confusing, he said, Ya Muhammad, Tell me about the hour. The Prophet said nothing. He asked him a third time, tell me about the hour. Look at the answer of the Prophet 
He said, the one who is asking knows very well that the one who's being asked knows no better than the one who's asking. <laughs> like you and I both know that we have no idea when the hour is. You don't know and I don't know. I don't even know why you're asking me that question. And it was to show the companion something, right? So then Jibreel said, well, tell me about its ashra, tell me about its signs. And the Prophet ﷺ, he mentioned two particular signs of corruption, that a woman would give birth to her master and barefoot Bedouins would start competing to build tall buildings. And he said, Sadaqt, you've told the truth. Abu Dhar, and in the narration of Umar as well, he said that the man suddenly left so quickly that we were all confused. And the Prophet ﷺ said, go see if you can find him. So all the Sahaba went around looking for him. They took their horses everywhere trying to find him. They came back to the Prophet ﷺ. They said, he's nowhere. The Prophet ﷺ said, do you know who that was? They said, no. He said, that was Jibreel coming to teach you your religion. Even the wording of the Prophet ﷺ. He wasn't coming to teach me. He was coming to teach you because he knows how you guys pay attention when questions are being asked. And so he asked the most important and essential questions and he succeeded because it's the most successful, it's the most important hadith in Islam. It is the foundations of our faith, the foundations of our religion, our creed. Everything is highlighted in that one incident, subhanAllah. So that's one way that the Prophet Sallallahu uh, was came to. Now what are some, now how does Jibreel act throughout the seerah? How does he come to the Prophet Sallallahu through the seerah? Okay, let's start off in Mecca. The role that he plays with the Prophet Sallallahu in supporting him and helping him cannot be exaggerated. I mean subhanAllah, it, you can't overstate it. It's it's so important, it's crucial. Not only is he with the Prophet in his low points, he's with him in his high points. You know when Umar ibn Khattab عنه, became Muslim, Ibn Mas'ud عنه, says, the day of the Islam of Umar was a victory for the Muslims. Why? Because when Umar became Muslim, suddenly they were able to do what? Publicly declare their, their, their Islam. Before Umar, no one could publicly declare their Islam. It was the first protest, the first time they walked out and said that they are Muslim. So they celebrated that day. The Prophet ﷺ said, "Lamma aslama Umar." When Umar became Muslim, Atani Jibril. Jibril came to me and he said, "Ya Muhammad, laqad istabshara ahlu samai bi Islami Umar." He said, "Oh Muhammad, the angels right now, the inhabitants of the heavens, are celebrating the Islam of Umar." Subhanallah. So he's with him in his high points. How about his low points? He's with the Prophet ﷺ. In every single incident, that, in every single hardship the Prophet ﷺ goes through. For example, Abu Jahal says that if this man puts his face in the dirt again in front of us, in front of the Kaaba, he swore by Allah wal Uzza, he swore by the idols that I'm going to step on his neck and I'm going to kill him. I'll do away with him. It'll be the end of Muhammad ﷺ. Prophet ﷺ, he comes out, he starts to pray in front of the Kaaba. Abu Jahl starts walking towards the Prophet ﷺ. Suddenly he puts his hands on his face, he screams and he runs. And they asked Abu Jahl what happened. He said, the ditch of fire. And he started saying these things like, there is something between me and him. When the Prophet ﷺ finished his salah, the companions came to him and they said, what happened? He said, Law fa'alahu la'akhadahu Jibreel. He said, if he would have tried that, Jibreel would have killed him. <laughs> like I know Jibreel is there and Jibreel would have done away with Abu Jahl. But it's also emotional support. And not only did Jibreel come to support the Prophet ﷺ emotionally, he also supported his family. Remember Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha? The Prophet ﷺ during the boycott, when they were living in those harsh circumstances, they lost everything. Khadija lost her money, he lost his money, they've lost their, you know, their status, they're being, they're being uh, ridiculed in society, their, you know, food is not reaching them properly, they barely are surviving. And Khadija is an older woman at that point as well. And Jibreel enters upon the Prophet ﷺ as Khadija is making whatever food that she has. And Jibreel says, هَذِهِ Khadija. That's Khadija. He's, tell like the he's telling the Prophet ﷺ, that's Khadija. He said, she's about to come to you with that tray of food. When she does, give her salam from Allah. And give her my salam. وَمِنِّ salam. Give her my salam as well. And give her the glad tidings of a home in Jannah that is made of qasab, la sakhaba fihi wa la nasab. It's made of pearls and there is no, there, there's not gonna be any noise or exhaustion or fatigue there. Meaning let her know that she's about to have a place in Jannah that far outdoes anything that she's sacrificed in this world. So the Prophet ﷺ, when Khadija comes, the Prophet ﷺ says, Hada Jibreel. Here is Jibreel. Gives you salam from Allah and he gives you salam from himself. And he gives you the glad tidings of a home in paradise made of pearls and there is no fatigue, no noise therein whatsoever. 
Khadija radiallahu anha demonstrating her spiritual maturity. She says, as for Allah, who is salam? Allah is peace. As for Jibreel, wa alayhi salam. And peace be on to him. And she said, inshallah, we will be patient. Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha, she died after that. She died shortly after that incident took place. And the Prophet obviously was devastated. And when Abu Talib died as well now, obviously the Prophet now was ridiculed far harsher and he was hit far harsher. And subhanAllah, there is a narration from Anas ibn Malik radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And this narration, the, the sanad is disputable, but the scholars, the chain is disputable, but the scholars still use it to show that incident, what was happening during the muqata'ah, during the boycott. That once the Prophet ﷺ was hit in the face and there was blood running down his face. This was just a random time. Someone hit him with an object and blood was running down his face. And the Prophet ﷺ, he just sat down grieving. So Jibreel came to him. And Jibreel said to him, Ya Muhammad Malik, what's wrong? And he said, look at what my people are doing to me. And Jibreel alayhi salam says, do you want me to show you an ayah? Do you want me to show you a sign? The Prophet ﷺ said, sure. He said, ud'u tilka shajara. Called that tree to come towards you. Now you might be thinking, yeah, whatever, trees moving, tree. Do you realize that over a hundred companions narrated the hadith that the Prophet ﷺ used to give khutbah leaning on a tree? And when we built him a manbar, when we built him a pulpit, and he went to that pulpit, the tree started to cry and shake. And the Prophet ﷺ went to it and comforted it until it stopped crying. <laughs> Those things happen to the Prophet ﷺ. Or how about the tree that is in the middle of nowhere on the outskirts of Jordan, in the middle of this desert, full, its branches are still full. It looks like, subhanAllah, it's as full as they come, it's green as they come, and there is nothing around it. Everything around it has, has died. And that was the tree that the Prophet ﷺ rested under when he went to Asham, when he went to that area. So here, when Jibreel tells the Prophet ﷺ, look, ud'u tilka shajra, tell that tree to come towards you. It's nothing new. The Prophet ﷺ, he calls the tree and the tree comes to him. Jibreel says, now tell it to go back. The Prophet ﷺ tells it to go back. Jibreel says, Radit. <laughs> Are you happy? Are you pleased now? And the Prophet ﷺ said, Hasbi. Yes, that's enough. Right? So Jibreel is coming to the Prophet ﷺ and he's reassuring him. Now, what's fascinating here and remarkable here is that Jibreel comes to the Prophet ﷺ at his lowest moment and then his highest moment. What was the worst moment of the Prophet ﷺ's life? What was the worst day of his life? In his own words, the last day of Ta'if. After two weeks of being humiliated, after two weeks of being rejected in the worst possible way, mocked and slandered, he's made to walk for 30 kilometers, that's 18 miles, about 18 miles, through a narrow row of people, children, and, and subhanAllah, people that had mental issues, and they were hitting the Prophet ﷺ, cursing him, and the blood was running down his body, and the stones were in his sandals, and the Prophet ﷺ was in the middle of nowhere, he didn't even know where he was after that. And he calls Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala complaining to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who does Allah send? Jibreel. Jibreel comes to the Prophet ﷺ and he has with him Malakul Jibal, an angel that can move mountains. And Jibreel says, Ya Muhammad, we have heard your complaint. And he says, with me is an angel, Malakul Jibal, an angel that can move these mountains. The angel says, Assalamu alayka ya Rasulullah, peace be unto you, O Messenger of Allah. And he says, you tell me what you want me to do. And he starts to suggest him. He said, if you want, I can take al akshabain The two mountains that are on, you know, if any of you have ever been to Hajj or Umrah, you know where Ajiyad is. That's where one mountain is, the other one on the other side of Ta'if. He said, I'll crush them all. I'll do away with them all. Whatever you tell me to do. The Prophet ﷺ said, even in that moment, he said, no, because maybe there will be from their children, people that will worship none but Allah. Maybe their children will be different. The children that just stoned him, subhanAllah, and hit him, maybe their children will be different. And as a result, Allah gifted the Prophet ﷺ with what? The children of his enemies. Abu Jahl's son, Ikrama, right? Uh, Al Walid ibn Mughira, his son, Khalid. Al As, his son, Amr, radiallahu anhum ajma'een. The greatest, some of the greatest companions, their fathers were the greatest enemies of the Prophet. ﷺ. Allah gifted the Prophet ﷺ with those people because the Prophet ﷺ never lost hope in his people. So that was the lowest moment of, of the Prophet ﷺ's life. That was what he called the worst day of his life. Now here's the thing, Allah says, إِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يسرى. With hardship comes ease. Right after the lowest moment of his life, Rasulullah ﷺ says, While I was sleeping, أَتَانِي جِبْرِيل فِي خُضْرٍ مُعَلَّقٍ بِهِ الدُّرِ Jibreel came to me wearing green garments, with rubies hanging, down, with rubies hanging from those green garments. And these, this is libasul jannah, the clothes of the people of paradise. 
So Jibreel came and it was clearly different. And he said, once again, Jibreel opened my chest. He took my heart. He put it into a vessel of Zamzam. And he poured into it Al-Iman wal hikmah More faith and more wisdom. Increasing the Prophet ﷺ. Renewing the Prophet ﷺ. This time the Prophet ﷺ knows what's happening. And he put his heart back. And he sewed it up again. And Jibreel ﷺ told the Prophet ﷺ to mount Al-Buraq. There was a particular animal, Al-Buraq. And there is no animal like that animal that we see. And subhanAllah, Al-Qadi Ayyad, he narrates that Al-Buraq was shy of the Prophet ﷺ. And Jibreel told Al-Buraq, look, there is no greater person that has ever mounted you than this man. Accept it. And the Prophet ﷺ, he mounted Al-Buraq and Jibreel took him somewhere. Where did Jibreel take him? Before Al-Aqsa. Took him to Medina. Okay, this is actually a long hadith in a Nasa'i. The Prophet ﷺ says, we got to a place and Jibreel told me to descend and to pray. So I descended and I prayed. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Jibreel said to me, do you know where you've prayed? I said, no. He said, this is Tayyibah. This is the pure land. Why did he say Taiba? Because the Prophet ﷺ went to Ta'if because he saw this land with greenery and palm trees and he thought that was Ta'if. It could either be Ta'if or Medina. They look exactly alike. They have the same climate. Ta'if made more sense to the Prophet ﷺ because it was right next to him and it had greater people in terms of status and lineage. And Jibreel is telling him, this is where you were supposed to go and this is the land of your Hijrah. This is where your Hijrah is going to be to. This is where you're going to migrate to. Then the Prophet ﷺ mounted again and he was told to dismount and pray. And Jibreel told him, do you know where you've prayed? The Prophet ﷺ said, no. He said, this is At-Tur. The place where Allah spoke directly to Moses, to Musa salam, Which is a sign of what? That this is about to happen to you too. Then he told him to mount once again and they reached another land, dismount and pray. The Prophet ﷺ said that he asked me, do you know where you've prayed? I said, no. He said, this is Bethlehem the place where Isa السلام, was born, Jesus peace be upon him was born. Which is a sign that this is a continuation of his message. Then he said, finally we arrived at Al-Aqsa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala liberated, Allahumma ameen. We arrived at Al-Aqsa, the place where Ibn Abbas anhu says, there isn't a single space there, not a handspan, except that an angel or a prophet has prayed there. Not a single handspan. And Rasulullah says, the anbiya were gathered for me. Prophet I mean this is a pretty, Amazing sight. He walks in and he sees the anbiya gathered in rows waiting for salah. And he says, Jibreel took me and he put me in the front and he said, Ya Rasulullah, lead them in salah. So he said, I led them in salah. Then Jibreel alayhi salam took my hand and we started to ascend. And he said, every time we got to one of the gates of the heavens, there was an angel at that gate of the heaven that said, who is it? And he said, Jibreel. And he said, man ma'ak, who's with you? And he would say, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And the angel would say, Ursila ilayhi, has he been sent for? And Jibreel would say, Naam, yes. And the angel would say, Marhaban bin Nabi Salih. Welcome to you, O righteous Prophet. Welcome to this righteous Prophet. SubhanAllah, this is right after the rejection of Ta'if. The angels are welcoming him in the heavens. The prophets are welcoming him in the heavens. The Prophet said, We continue to ascend. Suddenly, Jibreel alayhi salam, he had two glasses in his hand one of wine and one of milk, or one of milk and one of wine. Okay? One of milk and one of wine. And he presented them to the Prophet wasallam. Now is wine halal? What? Are you guys serious? I heard like 20 people just say yes. Is wine halal? Is wine halal? Are you sure? Okay good, because I'm going to change the topic completely if you guys say wine is halal. And we're, going to, we're going to have a fiqhi discussion right now as to what khamar is. Don't give me that grapes and non-grapes nonsense, alright? Wine is haram, okay? <laughs> But here's the thing, if Jibreel is presenting you wine, is it halal? Alright, so if you see a dude outside named Jibreel and he's presenting you a glass of wine, <laughs> is it halal? Or is it haram? It's haram, right? Now for the Prophet ﷺ, was it halal? It's 110% zabiha, hand cut, halal, whatever, <laughs> however you want to slice it, it's halal. Alright? But did the Prophet ﷺ say, well if it's Jibreel then I'm going to take that. No, he took the laban, he took the milk. And he drank the milk. Jibreel made a comment. Jibreel said, Alhamdulillah alladhi hadaka lil fitra. All praises be to Allah who guided you to your natural goodness. Law akhast al khamr, gawat ummatuk. If you would have drank the wine, your nation would have gone astray. Meaning Jibreel was happy for us as an ummah 
that the Messenger وسلم, chose the pure drink. He chose purity. He chose what his fitrah led him to. And that was a good sign for the ummah of Rasulullah The Prophet وسلم, said, we also saw on that day Al-Kawthar, the fountain that the Prophet وسلم, would serve his followers from on the day of judgment. And Rasulullah he asked Jibreel what is that? Jibreel said, this is the fountain that you will serve your followers from on the day of judgment. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us amongst them. Allahumma ameen. Then we continue to ascend and the Prophet وسلم, obviously met multiple prophets. He met numerous prophets starting with Adam alayhi salam ending with Ibrahim alayhi salam. When he reached Ibrahim alayhi salam he saw another site. He saw Al-Baytul Ma'mur. Baytul Ma'mur, the frequently visited house. And he asked Jibreel, what is that? And he said, this is Al-Baytul Ma'mur. It's the equivalent of the Kaaba on earth where 70,000 angels enter every day and do tawaf and they never return. So that's Al-Bayt Al-Ma'mur. The Prophet Sallallahu obviously continued to ascend until they reached Sidrat Al-Muntaha. And when they reached Sidrat Al-Muntaha, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala tells us what in the Quran? Afatumarunahu ala ma yara. Are you questioning what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saw? All right? And he says, وَلَقَدْ رَآهُ نَزْلَةً أُخْرَى He saw him a second time. Who is Allah talking about? Jibreel. He saw him a second time. Aisha radiallahu anha was very, very harsh with anyone that tried to say otherwise. Okay? Nazlatan ukhra, the second of two times, the only two times the Prophet would see Jibreel in his full form. Where at? Inda Sidrat al Muntaha. When they reached the Lot tree. The Lot tree is the boundary of Jannah and, and the rest of the heavens and the earth. Meaning what? No one goes beyond the Lot tree. No one goes beyond Sidrat al Muntaha. And the Prophet ﷺ this time looked at Jibreel ﷺ when they reached Sidrat al-Muntaha and once again sees him in his full form. This time he sees him from top to bottom. The first time he saw him, bottom to top, right? In his full form. The Prophet ﷺ said that Sidrat al-Muntaha, describing it, he said the colors of that tree were indescribable, right? Now here in Dallas, mashallah, we have a lot of places to scuba dive and snorkel, so we've seen the bottom of the ocean, right? Right? No, okay? <laughs> If you've ever been to the bottom of the ocean and you've seen the colors at the bottom of the ocean, are those colors describable? Are they? Not really, right? They're amazing. They're things that you've never seen before. Imagine Sidrat al Muntah. The Prophet said, Look, I can't describe to you the colors of that tree. But as the Prophet continued to go forward and he reached Sidrat al Muntah now and they were walking through, he said, Nadartu ila Jibreel. So I looked at Jibreel. Why? The entire journey goes like this. Jibreel, what's that? Ma hada ya Jibreel. Ma hada ya Jibreel. What's that? What's that? Who is that, ya Jibreel? He said, but this time, Nadartu ila Jibreel. Fa ida huwa kal hils al bali min khashiyatillah. He said, Jibreel was like a flattened rug out of his awe of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He was looking up and he was flattened. Meaning, subhanAllah, he was in complete awe of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, knowing the closeness that he had to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at that point of Sidrat al-Muntaha. And the Prophet sallallahu entered and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke to him directly the same way he spoke to Musa alayhi salam, to Moses peace be upon him, and he gave him the same order that he gave to Musa alayhi salam to establish the prayer. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi on his way down, and obviously I'm skipping some of the details of Al-Asra al-Mi'raj because of time, on his way down, the Prophet ﷺ said one more sight, one more sight that he saw. Rasulullah ﷺ said, Ra'aytul Umam. Suddenly I saw nations of people. They were standing behind their prophets. Each prophet had one or two or three or four or hundred or whatever it is, had someone behind him, right? And he said there were actually some prophets that had no one behind them at all. I just saw all of these nations, all of these prophets with their nations behind them. He said, then suddenly I saw this huge nation. Now realize the Prophet ﷺ at this point of his life has a very few, I mean he has a very small amount of followers. It's not that many followers, right? This is before Medina, before the Hijrah. You're talking about, you know, a hundred something followers. <laughs> and the Prophet ﷺ said, I saw this huge nation and I asked Jibreel, I said, Jibreel, is that mine? Jibreel said, no. I said, Jibreel took me. And he turned me around and he said, I saw a nation that was far bigger than that one. It dwarfed that nation. And Jibreel said, Ha'ula ummatuk. That's your ummah. SubhanAllah, can you imagine if we were standing there that day when Jibreel showed the Prophet some billions of people and said, That's your ummah. <laughs> Those are the amount of people that you're going to have that are going to follow you. The Prophet said, Then we returned. 
And subhanAllah, the next day Jibreel came to the Prophet ﷺ, this time in his human form. And he came to Rasulullah ﷺ at the time of Dhuhr. The command of prayer has been given to him. So he came to him at the time of Dhuhr and the Prophet ﷺ said, فَأَمَّنِي فَصَلَّيْتُ مَعَا He led me in prayer and I prayed behind him. And he came to me at Asr and did the same thing. Maghrib, Isha and Fajr and did the same thing. Then he came the next day at the end of those times and led me again and then told me that the salah is between these two, that your window of time is between these two prayers. Each salah is to be prayed between those two timings that we pray together. And subhanAllah, it was, it was common knowledge amongst the companions actually. This is an interesting historical fact without going too far into it, that some of the companions thought the Prophet ﷺ led Jibreel in salah. And it became a point of contention. And Umar ibn Abdul Aziz settled this debate in his home as the Khalifa, because Urwa ibn Zubair was the one narrating all the ahadith. He said, I'lam ma taqul ya Urwa. You better be sure of what you're saying, O Urwa. And Urwa went through all of the different chains of narration where the Prophet ﷺ said, Ja'ani fa'ammani. He came to me and he led me in salah. Fasallaytu ma'a. The same way that Jibreel came and showed the Prophet ﷺ hajj and he did hajj with him, he came to the Prophet ﷺ and he taught him the salah step by step, each and every single step of the prayer. And subhanAllah, the prayer would develop gradually over time, obviously, right? When the Prophet ﷺ was praying towards Al-Aqsa for 18 months or so, and then they were switched towards Mecca. And Jibreel ﷺ, he came to the Prophet ﷺ, and the Prophet ﷺ, he said, what happened to all the other, what happened to all the other prayers though? And Allah revealed what? وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to let your faith go to waste, your prayers go to waste. Now as a final note here before we break for Maghrib, just something very interesting here, very very cool that you might not have thought of. Do you ever mention Jibreel in your salah? Do you mention Jibreel in your salah? Alright, let's go through the different ways that you could possibly mention Jibreel in your salah. When the Prophet ﷺ would start his prayer, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she was asked, how did the Prophet ﷺ used to start his prayer? And she said that one of the things that he used to say, especially in his tahajjud, the Prophet ﷺ would say, Allahumma Rabba Jibreel wa Mika'il wa Israfil, Fatir as Samawati wal Ard, Alim al Ghaibi wa Shahada, until the end of the dua. It's a long dua. You can find it in Fortress of the Muslim. In fact, if you go to Google and you search Lord of Jibreel, Mikal, and Israfil, you're only going to get two duas. All right, so just search it, okay? So the Prophet ﷺ would make a dua in the beginning of a salah, mentioning the Lord of Jibreel, Mikail, and Israfil. How about in ruku' and in sujood, bowing and prostrating? This is interesting because we're about to go to salah right now, so I want you guys to try to remember this. Do you mention Jibreel? In fact, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned Jibreel in every single ruku' and in every single sujood. Subuh, Quddus, Rabbul Malaikati, wa ruh So you glorify Allah, the Lord of the angels, and specifically ar ruh Jibreel alayhi salam. And Aisha says the Prophet ﷺ never did ruku' or sujood except that he said it. Some of the scholars even considered it wajib. All right, it's a minor opinion, but that's how often the Prophet ﷺ used to say it. Some considered even mandatory. What about in your tashahud? So we've covered starting the salah, ruku' sujood. What about in your tashahud when you're sitting down? Listen to this hadith. Abu Salama radiallahu ta'ala anhu, uh, he says that the Prophet ﷺ, when, when he saw us after we were taught the prayer, he said, we used to say in our tashahud, when we sat down, As-salamu ala Allah, As-salamu ala Jibreel, As-salamu ala Mikail, As-salamu ala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa So they would send salam on Allah, Jibreel, Mikail, and then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. All right? The Prophet sallallahu came to us and he said, as for Allah, who was salam? Allah is as-salam. So instead say, At-tahiyyatu lillah wa salawatu wa tayyibat. There's, there's some uh, people that think that this was a conversation. So there is actually no authentic narration about this being a conversation. It may have been or may not have been, but it's not really established in any hadith whatsoever. The Prophet ﷺ said, look, instead say, At-tahiyyatu lillah. Greet Allah with your prayers, with your good deeds, and greet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in other ways. You can't say, As-salamu ala Allah. And you can say, As-salamu alayka ayyuha nabi So you send, you send salam on the Prophet ﷺ, Rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, assalamu alayna wa ala ibadillah salihin. Peace be on to us and on the righteous servants of Allah. You know what's amazing? The Prophet said, when you say ibadillah salihin, the righteous servants of Allah, it will reach Jibreel, it will reach Mikail, it will reach all of the inhabitants of the heavens and all of the inhabitants of the earth who are righteous servants of Allah. So when you say ala ibadillah salihin, you're actually making dua for Jibreel as well. 
you're sending salam on Jibreel as well. Finally, when you finish your prayer, Aisha radiallahu anha says, and this is the second of the two du'as that the Prophet used to say, Rabba Jibreel. The Prophet would say, Allahumma Rabba Jibreel wa Mika'il wa Israfil, a'idhni min harri nar wa adhab al qabr. Protect me from the punishment of hellfire and the punishment, the heat of hellfire and the punishment of the grave. So there is actually a mention of Jibreel Islam in every part of our salah. And with that, inshallah, we'll break for salah. And when we come back, inshallah, it's the best part of class. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa la'udwana illa ala al-zalimeen wa la'aqibatu al-muttaqeen. Allahumma salli wa sallam wa barak ala abdika wa rasulika Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So we come now to the, to the last session, the final session of this class. And subhanAllah, this is truly my favorite session because you can imagine now, after 13 years in Mecca, the relationship the Prophet ﷺ has with Jibreel ﷺ. Now they're beyond fully acquainted with one another. Now there is pure love between them. When the Prophet ﷺ made hijrah to Medina, there is a particular man, and you're going to wonder why I'm bringing him into the picture, but inshallah ta'ala you'll understand. There's a particular companion by the name of Hassan ibn Thabit radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Hassan ibn Thabit radiallahu ta'ala anhu, his job, he was a poet, and he actually used to get paid for his poetry. You know why? Because his poetry was to diss people, right? He was a professional disser. Literally, he'd get paid by people to look at you and to tell you how ugly you were and tell you how poor you were and tell you how low your family was and tell you how raggedy your clothes look. And <laughs> Hassan literally made a living. I know that's an awesome job, right? He literally made a living off of that, looking at people and putting them down, tearing them up on behalf of someone else. So Hassan's from Medina. They hired him to go out and see the Prophet ﷺ when they were entering into Medina so that he could author a poem about him. So all the Ansar are waiting in the trees, waiting outside, waiting for him every day. Hassan's just standing there waiting for him as well so that he could author that poem. So when the Prophet ﷺ enters into Medina, instead of saying anything bad about him, Hassan's like, I've got nothing. He authors one of the most beautiful poems about the Prophet ﷺ in history. And he becomes Muslim on the spot. So Hassan accepted Islam the moment the Prophet ﷺ entered into Medina. Now here's the thing, the Prophet ﷺ obviously had his share of naysayers in Medina as well. People that would mock him and some people that would come and challenge him in very you know, conniving ways and things of that sort. But the Prophet ﷺ was kind, he was humble. He wouldn't respond on, on behalf of himself most of the time. So Hassan ibn Thabit took it upon himself to basically defend the Prophet ﷺ against anyone that said anything about him. So a person says something about the Prophet ﷺ, walks in the masjid and disrespects him, Hassan stands up and starts going off on him. And Hassan also stands up and starts saying beautiful things about the Prophet ﷺ. So he authored poetry in praise of the Prophet ﷺ. And the Sahaba loved it. They loved it to a point that they built him a manbar. In the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ, there was a manbar for the Prophet ﷺ. The companions actually built a pulpit for Hassan to stand up and respond to people whenever they came and spoke to the Prophet ﷺ. So the Hassan anhu stands up for the first time on that manbar. The Prophet ﷺ looks at him and his eyes get really big. So they come to the Prophet ﷺ and they say, Ya Rasulullah, what is it? He said, Jibreel is with him right now. Jibreel is standing with Hassan right now. And in fact, every single time Hassan stood up to speak, the Prophet ﷺ would say, Uhjul mushrikeen ya Hassan, fa inna Jibreel ma'ak. Respond to them, oh Hassan, Jibreel is with you right now. And as Hassan would be about to stand up to speak, the Prophet ﷺ would make the dua, Allahumma ayyidhu bi ruh al-Qudus. Oh Allah, support him with the Holy Spirit, with Jibreel alayhi salam. So Hassan stands up there, Jibreel automatically comes down and starts helping Hassan in responding to the things that are said about the Prophet ﷺ. You want to know what's amazing about that? And Imam Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, when anyone responds to insults on behalf of the Prophet ﷺ, and obviously we've got to qualify, it doesn't mean killing cartoonists, and it doesn't mean Paris, and it doesn't mean that stuff. It means when you intellectually defend the Prophet ﷺ, when you, when, you, when you remove the doubts about his character, when you respond to the things that are said about him, Jibreel alayhi salam would support him. His proof, the ayah in Surah Al-Mujadila, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, لا تجد قوما يؤمنون بالله واليوم الآخر يوادون من حاد الله ورسوله. So he said, you would not. Allah Azza says, you would not find a people 
who believe in Allah in the last day, that love those that, 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 that show enmity to Allah and the Messenger وسلم, even if it was their families, their fathers, their brothers, whatever it may be. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says at the end of it what? أُولَٰئِكَ كَتَبَ فِي قُلُوبِهِمُ الْإِيمَانِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has written faith in their hearts. And what does He say at the end of that ayah? وَأَيَّدَهُمْ بِرُوحٍ مِنْ And He supports them with the spirit from Him. Ibn al-Qayyim says, when anyone Response and subhanAllah, I can tell you, ask anyone that's in the field of da'wah that speaks, when you start talking about the character of the Prophet, it's different. I've never had a conversation with anyone about the character of the Prophet responding to anything that was said about him, except that the other person was convinced. I've never seen people, you know, not moved by the character of the Messenger. And obviously, when you respond to all the terrible lies that are said about him in the media and so on and so forth. That's a way to actually bring Jibreel into your life practically. Respond on behalf of the Prophet ﷺ and Jibreel comes into your life. So anyway, that's there. But who was the tribe that put Hassan up to it? It was a tribe by the name of Bani Quraidha. Now Bani Quraidha is a tribe that already hated the Messenger ﷺ before he even got to Medina. They already decided that we're going to take him as an enemy. Why? Because they were waiting for a Messenger of Allah and it didn't turn out to be from their people and they expected that it would be from their people. And there's this thought, because Bani Quraida happens to be a Jewish tribe, there's this, this thought that there was enmity between the Muslims and the Jews, which is utterly untrue. It's completely untrue. In fact, the neighbor of the Prophet ﷺ for his entire life was a Jew. It was a Jewish family. Rasulullah ﷺ would visit them. He visited the man when his son became sick. His son took shahada when he died with the approval of his father. The Prophet ﷺ used to be frequent in visiting him. There were Jewish, there were, there were large groups of Jews that accepted Islam. The two chief rabbis in Medina, Abdullah ibn Salam, Hussein ibn Salam, who became Abdullah ibn Salam. Zayd ibn Sa'na, may Allah be pleased with them both. Both accepted Islam. So Bani, Bani Quraidha happens to be a tribe that rejects the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And they rejected him in nasty ways, okay? They met, they met the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they asked him a bunch of questions. He answered all of their questions the way that he was supposed to answer them. So they recognize that someone is giving him the answers, meaning that he has a presence that's giving him the answers. So they say at the end of that conversation, they say, Ya Abu al-Qasim, calling him by his kunya, the father of Qasim, as a means of respect, baqiyat wahida, right? We have one more question for you. We've asked you all these questions. We have one more question for you. Tukhbiruna man waliyuka min al-malaika. Tell us who your guardian, who your protector from the angels is. Who is your wali from the malaika? Imma taba'naak wa imma faraqnaak. As a result of that, we will either follow you or we will leave you. The Prophet ﷺ said, Waliyi min al malaika Jibreel. My wali from the angels is Jibreel. You know what their response was? They said, Hada ladi yanzil bil harbi wal qital. Are you talking about that one that comes down with death and destruction? They insulted Jibreel alayhi salam. They said, Law qulta Mika'il. Had you said Mika'il, la tabarnak, we would have followed you. We're okay with Michael. We're okay with Mikal. Had you said him, we would have followed you. But we want nothing to do with you or Jibreel. You can turn away, we want nothing to do with you or Jibreel. Now subhanAllah, Allah defended Jibreel alayhi salam. Allah revealed an ayah in Surah Al-Baqarah, قُلْ مَنْ كَانَ عَدُوًّا لِجِبْرِيلِ فَإِنَّهُ نَزَّلَهُ عَلَىٰ قَلْبِكَ بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ Say whoever is an enemy to Gabriel, to Jibreel, say that he is the one that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent to your, the, the revelation with to your heart by his permission. And Allah praises Jibreel alayhi salam. Interestingly enough, in Judeo-Christian thought, by the way, Michael is the only archangel named in the Bible. And Michael, by consensus of Judeo-Christian uh, scholars, is more, it has a higher status than Gabriel. However, they don't necessarily, they don't take Gabriel as an enemy. To the contrary, they praise Gabriel and they speak well of him. This tribe took it to an extreme. They said, you know what, we don't like Jibreel. We're, we're okay with Mikal. We don't like Jibreel, alayhi salam. And Allah actually revealed an ayah in defense of Jibreel alayhi salam. Now, moving forward, obviously, the people of Mecca decided to pursue the Muslims in Medina, and here they are now, a handful of people. They don't have much, they don't have much to defend themselves with. They're only 313 at this point, all right? The mushrikeen from Mecca, they send a thousand. They say, we'll send three to their one. Not only that, we'll send plenty of horsemen. They didn't have any horses or camels to fight with. They didn't have horses or camels that would work in battle. 
The people of Mecca said, we'll send multiple horses and we'll even send extra horses and camels and we'll put wine on them so that when you finish killing them, you can celebrate over their dead bodies. So probably look at the arrogance and the audacity of the people in Mecca. Little did they know, it doesn't go that way. It doesn't work that way. So as Badr is coming up, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa gets word from Jibreel alayhi salam that he's going to have some support on that day. All right. And to give you an idea of how this works, there's actually a biblical mention of this as well. Jibreel as leading the army of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In Joshua 5, 13 to 15. Joshua 5, 13 to 15. When Yusha, Joshua alayhi salam reached Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked and behold, a man was standing before him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, are you for us or are you for our enemies? And he said, no, but I am the commander of the army of your Lord. So this is Jibreel alayhi salam, right? The angel who leads also the army of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the army of the angels. Now, Jibreel alayhi salam is always there with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi in all of these battles. And in fact, Hassan ibn Thabit radiallahu anhu, he used to say before every battle, like he used to say this, and this is in Bukhari, he used to say, Rasulullah fina wa ruhul qudusi laysa lahu kifa'u. He's like, we're fine. The Messenger of Allah is amongst us and Jibreel has no match. It doesn't matter who's coming to fight us. It doesn't matter how many weapons they have. It doesn't matter how many horses they have. Hassan knows how Jibreel's support comes into play. He says, Ruhul Qudusi laysa lahu kifa'u. Jibreel will have no match. Ka'b ibn Malik radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said as they were marching to the, to the battlegrounds of Badr, he says, wa bi yawmi badrin hina tumha wujuhahum Jibreel tahta liwa'ina wa muhammadu. He said on the, on the day of Badr, when their faces were humiliated, the enemies were humiliated, Jibreel was standing under our banner and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So they start this battle. And before the battle, something interesting happens. Now to put, to give you proper context, the Prophet sallallahu said the worst day of the year for shaitan. Shaitan hates no day more than what day? Ramadan's not a day. It might be for you, <laughs> but... <laughs> <laughs> Ramadan's a month, people, come on. <laughs> What's the worst day of the year for shaitan? What day does shaitan hate more than any other day? Arafah, the day of Arafah. The Prophet said, there is no day that shaitan is more humiliated and despised than the day of Arafah, right? Why? Because shaitan has been working on a person to make him slip and go to hell for 70, 80 years. He stands up and says, Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. I seek your forgiveness, O Allah, on the day of Arafah. Allah forgives him. On that day, the Prophet ﷺ said, more people are forgiven and freed from the fire than any other day of the year. So shaitan hates Arafah. That's the worst day of his life, except that the Prophet ﷺ says, Illa Badr, except for the day of Badr. So we said, Ya Rasulullah, what, what's up with the day of Badr? He says, Ama innahu qad ra'a Jibreel malaika. Didn't he see Jibreel getting the angels ready for battle? Meaning, Badr was supposed to be the end of Islam. Badr was supposed to be the day we do away with the Muslims and we eliminate this cancer once and for all and we kill them all and we massacre them and we never have to worry about Islam again. So it's, it's a greater prize than just taking one person to hell. We ruin Islam, we ruin the message. Shaitan shows up on the day of Badr, he sees Jibreel and he knows how this goes. He knows exactly how this goes. He's seen it go down way too many times in the past to have any hope whatsoever now that his army is going to win that day. The Prophet ﷺ, before the day of Badr, he says, هذا Jibreel, here is Jibreel. He's holding the reins of his horse. And he's ready to go. How many of them are there, Ya Rasulullah? The Prophet ﷺ said, Allah has sent 3,000 of them. Why is that number significant? Allah says it in the Quran as well. Why is it significant? Because the believers were outnumbered three to one, 1,000 to 313. Allah sent 3,000 angels for their 1,000. This isn't going to go well for them. <laughs> Rasulullah also said that Jibreel is wearing a golden colored turban. You know why? Because as Zubair ibn Awam radiallahu ta'ala anhu was wearing a golden colored turban and he was leading the believers, the human soldiers of that day. Jibreel alayhi salam kana yatamathalu bihi. He was, he was following as Zubair radiallahu ta'ala anhu while all the other angels were wearing white turbans. They're ready to go. Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu, to give you an idea of how this battle goes. Umar radiallahu anhu says, look, we've seen strange things in our lives. We've seen strange things. Nothing stranger than the day of Badr. He said, we didn't have to do anything. 
We were fighting and people are flying off of their horses. <laughs> we had absolutely nothing to do. So Umar radiallahu anhu says, we even saw a man that was one of, one of the believers who, 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 lost his, who lost his weapons and there was a horseman coming after him. So he held himself, you know, because he was going to die. And he was with the Prophet sallallahu and a group of companions. They saw the man and they wouldn't be able to get to him in time. And as he was being charged up by the horseman, he said, we heard a sound, aqdim hayzum. Go forth, Hazum. And he said, suddenly that man flew off of his horse and died. And we looked at the Prophet ﷺ and we were like, what was that? Rasulullah ﷺ said, Hazum is an angel from the third heaven. Hazum is the name of an angel that was sent from the third heaven to protect that man at that moment. Abu Sufyan, who obviously was an enemy, he was on the other side. Abu Sufyan, when he got back to Mecca and they were shocked because he was a leader, said, how did you guys lose the battle? He said, we fought men that were the size of mountains. They could hit us, we couldn't hit them. They were striking us, every time we tried to strike them, it didn't work. In fact, Al-Abbas Al-Abbas came on the side of the mushrikeen. He was concealing his Islam if he became Muslim. He didn't want to fight, so he didn't fight. Al-Abbas was a huge man. He was a huge man. The guy that captured him was Abu Yusr al-Sulami radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Abu Yusr was really, really, really tiny. So when he came holding Al-Abbas, they were like, how did that happen? And he's like, Ya Rasulullah, there was this man that showed up out of nowhere. I don't know where he came from. He started tying him up with me and that was easy. The Prophet ﷺ says, لَقَدْ أَعَانَكَ عَلَيْهِ مَلَكٌ كَرِيمٌ There was a noble angel that supported you in bringing him forth. Umar bin Khattab عنه, also narrates something beautifully. They did salah on the day of Badr. They did prayer. And it was the first time they did Salatul Khawf the prayer of fear. And he said, we could feel the warmth of the hand of Jibreel alayhi salam as he was arranging our rows for salah. That they were being arranged in their salah even on the day of Badr. So the day of Badr finishes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them a victory. But what happened on the day of Badr that was very sad? It was the day of great joy and the day of great sadness. Ruqayya radiallahu anha, the daughter of the Prophet sallallahu passed away on the same day of the, of the victory of Badr. She stayed back with Uthman radiallahu anhu, her husband, and Uthman was watching her, and the news that she passed away came at the same time as the news that they won that battle. So Uthman radiallahu anhu became very sad. Uthman and Ruqayya, may Allah be pleased with them both, they were the ideal couple. They, went, they made the hijrah to Habasha together, to Abyssinia together, and they made it to Medina together. And people, you know, husbands used to tell their wives, I love you like Uthman loves Ruqayya. That was the amount of love. So Uthman was crushed, radiallahu anhu. And he kind of went, you know, he, he, he avoided people for some time after Badr. And the Prophet ﷺ, he found Uthman, radiallahu anhu, one day standing alone. And he said to him, Ya Uthman, Malik. He said, Uthman, what is, what's going on? Talk to me. Uthman, radiallahu anhu, said, The death of Ruqayya. And he said, And something else. The Prophet ﷺ said, What is it? He said, In qata'a sayri wa qurbi minka bi mawtiha. My connection to you was severed by her death. I'm no longer your son-in-law. So it's not just losing her, it's losing you as well. As soon as Uthman said that, the Prophet ﷺ said, Ya Uthman, hadha Jibreel. Jibreel is with me. Akhbarani anna Allah qad zawajaka um Kulthum. Jibreel is here and Jibreel just said, Marry to him, your other daughter Um Kulthum, with the same sadaq, with the same dowry. And ala mithli suhbatiha, treat her the way that you treated Ruqayya. Jibreel was with the Prophet as he goes to see Uthman ta'ala anhu at that moment. And by the way, Jibreel particularly loved Uthman. And in fact, Jibreel kana yastahi min Uthman. His modesty used to show with Uthman ta'ala anhu. So Jibreel is very modest. Uthman was the most modest of the companions. And the Prophet ﷺ, he used to act a different way in front of Uthman. In a way, he wouldn't even act with Abu Bakr and Umar. He would sit up straight, he would fix his clothes, he acted in a certain way. And Aisha said, Ya Rasulullah, why do you do that? He said, Ala astahi min rajul. Shouldn't I be a shy of a, shouldn't I be shy of a man? Tastahi minhu al-malaika. The angels are shy of that man. Jibreel is shy of that man. Of course I'm shy around that man. So Jibreel Islam is with the Prophet ﷺ during Badr, after Badr, and in these very intimate moments as well. Interestingly enough, Jibreel comes to the Prophet ﷺ after the Battle of Badr. In, this is in Sahih al-Bukhari. He says to the Prophet ﷺ, مَا تَعْدُونَ مَنْ شَهِدَ بَدْرَ فِيكُمْ How do you, the companions, view the veterans of Badr amongst you? The veterans of Badr were very special people. They were very special people. In fact, the way we treat our veterans here in this country as well, we honor them, respect them, right? They're mentioned before gatherings and things of that sort. 
The Prophet ﷺ honored the veterans of Badr in any situation he could. Before gatherings, he honored them. You know, even the Khulafa afterwards, they honored the veterans of Badr because of what they, you know, how they sacrificed themselves when really, it, you know, the prospects were not good. I mean, it didn't look good for them, but they still put it all on the line and they defended themselves, right? And, and, and as a result of that, look what happened. Okay, so the Prophet ﷺ honored them. So when Jibreel asked the Prophet ﷺ that question, how do you view the veterans of Badr amongst you? The Prophet said, Khiyarana. They're the best of us. Jibreel alayhi salam, he said, وَكَذَلِكْ هُمْ عِنْدَنَا خِيَارُ الْمَلَائِكَ And likewise to us, they're the best of the angels. We consider the veterans of Badr amongst us to be the best of us. SubhanAllah, because they were in support of the Messenger sallallahu What about the battle of Uhud? Rasulullah sallallahu says, on the day of the battle of Uhud, he said, I saw myself and there was no one around me illa Jibreel an yamini he says, except Jibreel was on my right and Talha was on my left. So Jibreel Islam was there defending him on the day of Uhud as well. In the battle of Khandaq, now realize in the battle of Khandaq now, we're talking about close to 100,000 people coming from outside to massacre the Muslims. And the only way they protected themselves was they built, was they built a trench. At the suggestion of Salman radiallahu ta'ala anhu, the Persian, they built a trench so that they could not come into Medina you know, through that trench. So they protected themselves that way. So no actual fighting took place over there. However, what tribe cooperated with the outsiders to attack from inside? Bani Quraidah. The Prophet ﷺ was unaware of that. Rasulullah ﷺ, he went home after they built the trench. Aisha radiallahu anha says, Rasulullah ﷺ got home after he built the trench. He took off his armor and he went to wash himself where suddenly we heard a loud noise at the door. So the Prophet ﷺ, he put his clothes on, he went to the door, he opened the door, Jibreel ﷺ was standing there, and Rasulullah ﷺ said he still had his armor on, and Jibreel ﷺ, and not his armor, he was holding his sword, and he said, قَدْ وَلَعْتَ silah, You've put down your stuff. Wallahi ma wallahtu, we haven't put ours down. The Prophet ﷺ thinks there is no battle, what's going on here? So Rasulullah ﷺ said, إِلَىٰ أَيْنْ, where to? فَأَشَارَ إِلَىٰ بَنِي قُرَيْدَ Jibreel simply pointed in the direction of Bani Quraidah and they foiled a plot that was, that was being made from inside to kill people. And actually they attacked the women and children. If you see the story of Umm Sulaim, Umm Sulaim, she fought them off from the women and children. And Anas ibn Malik anhu says that we will never forget in Medina the Prophet wasallam walking towards Banu Ghanim, walking towards the area of Bani Quraidah and he said, the dirt that was kicking up behind him from the procession of the army of Jibreel alayhi salam. Some mighty army that walks with the Prophet sallallahu of angels and uh, with the believers in this case. Now obviously put the battles aside. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi also has Jibreel to celebrate him with him in Hajjat al-Wada' as well. The only Hajj the Prophet sallallahu alayhi made. Now you guys know when you go for Hajj and you're getting on the bus and you're leaving, and everyone's really excited when they do ihram. And they say, لَبَّيْكَ اللَّهُمَّ لَبَّيْكَ لَبَّيْكَ لَا شَرِيكَ لَكَ لَبَّيْكَ And they're really into the talbiyah. Then like five minutes later, it's just <laughs> And they got the weird, awkward, you know, phone, phone tunes going off and stuff like that. Right? Everyone stops doing talbiyah. Now with the Prophet ﷺ and the companions, they're walking into Mecca, which, which was previously hostile territory. And this is the only time they're doing Hajj and they have no weapons on them. And they're in Ihram, they're pretty exposed and vulnerable. Meaning if the people of Mecca want to change their minds and attack them, they will. So they were doing Talbiyah like this. They weren't doing it loud. So the Prophet ﷺ said, Jibreel came to me. And Jibreel said, Ya Muhammad, mur ashabak and yarfa' aswatahum fi Talbiyah. Jibreel came to me and said, Ya Muhammad, tell your companions, raise their voices in Talbiyah. Don't lower your voices in Talbiyah, raise your voices in Talbiyah. We've got your back. Nothing's gonna happen to you guys, subhanAllah. So they started to raise their voices after Jibreel told the Prophet ﷺ that. Now, move on past that. My favorite part of the class is where it gets personal. The personal incidents and discussions with the Prophet ﷺ and Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam. Jibreel was with the Prophet ﷺ in his home many times speaking to him. And in fact, sometimes some people could see him and others could not. Al-Abbas was with his son Abdullah and they went to visit the Prophet ﷺ. And Al-Abbas, he was talking to the Prophet ﷺ. And the Prophet ﷺ was seemingly ignoring him. So the Prophet ﷺ, 
you know, just let him go without saying anything to him. And Abbas tells his son, Abdullah ibn Abbas anhuma, says, you know, why is it that your cousin is not speaking to me? Why do you think, as if he's pu pushing me away? Abdullah says, didn't you see the man that was sitting next to him, Yunajihi, speaking to him? He said, what man? What are you talking about? So Abbas went back to the Prophet and said, was there a man that was talking to you and giving you advice right now and giving you, you know, uh, you not, and, and was giving, you know, was speaking to you and reminding you. And Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi says, why are you asking? He says, because Abdullah saw him. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said, Ra'a? <laughs> he saw him? And Al-Abbas said, yes. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi da'a lahu He made dua to Allah to increase him in knowledge. So there are many personal conversations here. And Abdullah ibn Abbas Sallallahu Ta'ala Anhu, who knows what that, what it's like when Jibreel comes to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi you know what he says? The very famous hadith you see in Ramadan, to first give you an idea of what this personal relationship is like, he says the Prophet ﷺ was always extremely generous. But he said, Hina yalqahu Jibreel. When Jibreel would meet him, he would be more generous than what? A rih al mursala, than a blowing wind. And the scholars say he chose Ru'ya Jibreel, seeing Jibreel, even though it's Ramadan, he chose particularly Jibreel because Jibreel was with the Prophet ﷺ most. In Ramadan. And what motivated the Prophet ﷺ was what Imam al Nawi rahimahullah says, Ru'ya to Salihin, seeing the righteous people. When the Prophet ﷺ just saw Jibreel, he was more motivated to do good. He was motivated by seeing Jibreel. ﷺ. So that was the type of effect Jibreel had on the Prophet ﷺ personally. What about the Prophet ﷺ to Jibreel? Al Qadi Ayyad, he writes a very famous seerah of the Prophet ﷺ called Ash Shifa, the cure. And he says in that book, in the introduction, Describing وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ When Allah says that we have not sent you except as a mercy to all of the world, He describes a narration, an incident that took place between the Prophet ﷺ and Jibreel. Rasulullah ﷺ asked Jibreel, He says, you know Allah says in the Qur'an وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ We have not sent you except as a mercy to all of the world. He said, did any of my mercy reach you? I mean, you're part of the world, you're, part of, you're the realm of the malaika, you're the realm of the angel. Did any of that rahmah reach you? Jibreel alayhi salam responded and he said, Ya Muhammad, wallahi innaka ahabbul anbiya ilayhi. He said, I swear by Allah, you are the most beloved of the prophets to me. I've never been sent to someone that I loved more than I loved you. He said, and it was through you that I gained security. What does he mean by that? He said, I used to wonder about my fate until Allah revealed to you عند ذو العرش مكين that he's established in his position with the owner of the throne. Before that was revealed to you, Jibreel used to wonder what would happen to him at the end of this all. When Allah revealed that to the Prophet ﷺ, Jibreel felt the rahmah of the Prophet ﷺ. That had never happened before until that was revealed to the Prophet ﷺ. So there's that, that's the effect they have on each other. Jibreel continues to reassure the Prophet ﷺ. So a multitude of the personal conversations now in Medina are constant reassurance. Why? Because look, the Prophet ﷺ now was reassured that he's safe and the believers are safe. Who is the Prophet ﷺ worried about now? Us, those that come after. So he cries, Ummati, Ummati, my nation, my nation. And Allah sends him Jibreel. And Jibreel says, Ya Muhammad, sanurdika bi ummatik. We will please you with your nation. We will not disappoint you. you want, your nation will be okay. Your ummah will be okay. He comes to reassure the Prophet ﷺ in Medina now because now he's worried about the ummah, those that will come after. They're safe, but what happens afterwards to those that come after? Another time, Umar al-Khattab says, and this is in a Bukhari, he says, I was actually walking with the Prophet ﷺ in Medina and we reached Al-Harra, an area in Medina, and he told me to sit down. Suddenly he started to walk and he was clearly talking to Jibreel ﷺ. I could tell he was talking to Jibreel. And he said, they walked for a while and I just sat there. And the Prophet ﷺ, as he's walking back, he's saying, وَإِن زَنَا وَسَرَقْ وَإِن زَنَا وَسَرَقْ وَإِن زَنَا وَسَرَقْ Even if he stole and committed adultery? Even if he stole and committed adultery? And Umar is not hearing the answer. So Umar says, Ya Rasulullah, what was that? The Prophet ﷺ says, that was Jibreel. He came to me to give me the glad tidings that each and every single person of this ummah would enter Jannah, would eventually enter Paradise. So the Prophet said, وَإِنْ زَنَا وَسَرَقْ Even if he stole and committed adultery? Yes, even if he stole and committed adultery, eventually he would enter into paradise. 
eventually he would enter into Jannah. So he eases the Prophet in that way. What about when the Prophet becomes physically sick? Do you know that some of the du'as of Ruqya that we learn to read upon a person are from Jibreel alayhi salam? How? The Prophet when he became sick, he said Jibreel came to me and said to me, Ya Muhammad, oh Muhammad, ishtakait, are you feeling ill? Are you sick? And I said, Naam. I said, yes. So he said, Jibreel started to rub his hands on my face and on my chest and said, Bismillahi arqika min kulli shay'in yu'dhika. In the name of Allah, I seek a cure for you from everything that is harming you. Min sharri kulli nafsin aw aynin aw hasid. From, from the evil of any, of, of any evil person or any envious eye, Allah yashfika, may Allah cure you. Bismillahi arqika. In the name of Allah, I seek a cure for you. So we actually learned that, that dua from Jibreel reading it over the Prophet ﷺ. However, the most profound of these conversations are the ones where Jibreel is giving advice to the Prophet ﷺ. Can you imagine getting access to that conversation? Sayyidul Malaika, the chief of the angels, gives advice to Sayyidul Walid, Walid the Adam, to the chief of mankind, gives him advice. And subhanAllah, when you think about how profound that is, I mean, we're, we're blessed to have access to those conversations because it's advice for all of us. And Jibreel gives advice to the Prophet ﷺ? Yes, he does. In fact, the Prophet ﷺ was seen going to his neighbor's house, the Jewish neighbor, by the way, over and over and over again, taking them things, serving them. And the Sahaba asked him, Ya Rasulullah, we noticed that all of a sudden, you keep going to your neighbor's house. He said, Hada Jibreel. Yulsini bil jar. Jibreel was coming to me and advising me, take care of your neighbor, take care of your neighbor. Until I thought Jibreel was going to say, now you assign inheritance to him. So Jibreel kept coming to me and saying, go to your neighbor, go to your neighbor, go to your neighbor, take care of your neighbor. You know, subhanAllah, serve your neighbor. And this is beautiful because that's a cornerstone of every religion, right? Love thy neighbor, right? This is a part of our faith as well. That Jibreel, that's what he says to him over and over and over again. The Prophet ﷺ also was once seen saying, Ameen, Ameen, Ameen. And Sahaba said, Ya Rasulullah, why are you saying Ameen? He said, well, Jibreel was making dua. And Jibreel made dua against three people. The one whose parents reach old age and he doesn't honor them. Jibreel said, Rahima anfu. You know, SubhanAllah, Jibreel ﷺ made dua against that person, may be humiliated. The second person, the one who Ramadan comes and goes and he's not forgiven by his creator. It's such a merciful month. It's a month of mercy. How can Ramadan come upon you and leave you and you're not forgiven by your Lord? The third one, the one who hears the name of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam and doesn't say sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Jibreel Islam found that offensive. But what's it like when Jibreel decides to tell the Prophet sallallahu something, when he gives him life advice? Now this narration that I'm about to share with you, is towards the end of the life of the Prophet ﷺ. We know that because of the age of the Sahaba that narrated it. They were young children that narrated this narration. It happens when the Prophet ﷺ now is established, he's successful, everything is done, right? People are coming into the religion and throng, everything is, is done. Jibreel comes to the Prophet ﷺ and he says, Ya Muhammad, O Muhammad, now, by the way, does Allah ever say to the Prophet ﷺ, Ya Muhammad in the Quran? No. Ya Nabi Allah, Ya Rasulullah, O Prophet of God, O Messenger of God. So why is it that Jibreel has the audacity to say Ya Muhammad? In fact, the scholars say when Jibreel says Ya Muhammad, he's telling the Prophet ﷺ, this is outside of the capacity of revelation. What I'm about to say to you is from me, Jibreel, to you, Muhammad. So that's the only time he doesn't say Ya Rasulullah is when I want to tell you something just between me and you now. Okay? So he says, Ya Muhammad, five advices here. Ish ma shi't fa inna kamayit. Live as you will, but know that one day you're going to die. One day you're going to die. He says, Wahbib ma shi't fa inna kamufariqu. Love whom you will, but know that one day you will be separated from that person. So the first ones don't get attached to this, this world. Your purpose lies beyond this world. Don't get attached to people of this world because eventually they will leave you and you will leave them. Do as you will and know that you will be compensated and rewarded accordingly. The compensation is in the hereafter. Meaning what? Everything comes in the hereafter. All the reward comes in the hereafter. Keep doing what you do and know that the reward is in the hereafter. So the first one, Live as you will but know that one day you're going to die. 
وَحْبِبْ مَا شِئْتْ فَإِنَّكَ مُفَارِقُ Love who you will, but know that one day you will be separated from that person. وَعْمَلْ مَا شِئْتْ فَإِنَّكَ مَجْزِيٌ بِهِ Do as you will, and know that one day you will be rewarded accordingly. وَعْلَمْ أَنَّ شَرَفَ الْمُؤْمِنْ قِيَامُهُ بِالْلَيْلِ Know that the nobility of the believer is his standing up in prayer at night. It's not in being a ruler, it's not in having thousands of followers, it's not in being a king, it's not in having this or having that. The nobility of a person comes from his standing up in prayer at night, invoking his Lord. وَعْلَمْ أَنَّ شَرَفَ الْمُؤْمِنْ قِيَامُهُ بِاللَّيْلِ وَعِزَّهُ And as for his dignity, اِسْتِغْنَاؤُهُ عَنِ النَّاسِ It's his being independent of people. Financially, emotionally, mentally, physically, your izza, your dignity as a person is try not to be dependent on people. Try to absolve yourself of needing people in any way whatsoever. That's profound life advice right there. SubhanAllah, that's something that we can all take to ourselves. Now the next incident I'll share with you is actually Jibreel giving advice in a very subtle way, but it's profound advice as well. This narration that I'm about to share with you is so profound Al-Hafid ibn Rajab rahimahullah in his famous book Al-Khushu' fi salah Humility in Prayer, the last chapter is just about this hadith, even though it has nothing to do with prayer because of what it means. The Prophet ﷺ, he says in an authentic hadith that I was sitting with Jibreel alayhi salam. فَإِذَا شَقَّ أُفُقُ السَّمَاءِ And then all of a sudden the sky split وَنَزَلَ مَلَكَ And an angel came down. فَأَقْبَلَ إِلَيْنَا And he started to come close to us. Now you want to know what makes this narration so strange? Rasulullah says, فَلَمَّا رَآهُ جِبْرِيلِ تَسَاغَرْ When Jibreel saw this angel, he became smaller, he held himself. The ulama say tasagar, he held himself, like bracing for something. The angel came to the Prophet and said, يَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ O Messenger of Allah, إِنِّي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ إِلَيْكَ I'm a messenger that's been sent to you from God. أُخَيِّرُكَ I'm giving you a choice. بَيْنَ أَن تَكُونَ نَبِيًّا عَبْدًا أَوْ نَبِيًّا مَلِكًا I'm here to give you a choice. Either you live, you're a prophet who lives like a king or a prophet that lives like a humble slave. Who can give me an example of Nabi and Malika? A prophet that lives like a king. Sulaiman alayhi salam, Dawood alayhi salam. And Nabi and Malika means that you'll live comfortable. Look, you can have a great life, live very comfortably, be a king, have the riches of this world, do whatever you want, and you'll still have the hereafter. It's not going to decrease from you in any way whatsoever. So you can either be that or you can continue to live like a humble slave. I mean, the Prophet ﷺ used to go nights in hunger, stones tied to his stomach. He suffered from poverty at the very worst, even after success, right? So you have a choice now. So the Prophet ﷺ said, فَنَظَرْتُ إِلَىٰ جِبْرِيلِ I looked at Jibreel. He said, فَأَشَارَ إِلَيَّ أَنْ تَوَاضَعُ Jibreel did this. So the Prophet ﷺ said, I said to him, بَلْ نَبِيًّا عَبْدًا I'll choose to be a prophet that lives like a humble slave. So the angel left. So I looked at Jibreel alayhi salam. This was very strange. Jibreel alayhi salam said, هذا الملك, this angel, لم ينزل قبل اليوم. He's never been down before this day. So the Prophet says, فما بالك تصغرت? Why is it that you got smaller and, and, and we're afraid? He said, وَاللَّهِ مَا ظَنَنْتُهُ نَزَلَ إِلَّا بِقِيَامِ السَّاعَةِ He said, I swear by Allah, I didn't think that he came except to announce the day of judgment. Who was that angel? Israfil. When Jibreel saw Israfil come down, he thought it was all over. So Jibreel even became afraid at the sight of Israfil. And Ibn Rajab rahimahullah, the, he ends his book with Bal Nabi and Abda, choose to be a humble servant. And how did this affect the Prophet physically as well? I mean, obviously, he continued to live in very humble means. The Prophet, when he used to eat his food, sometimes he'd lay back, recline, and eat. But after that incident, the Prophet ﷺ would only eat his food sitting up. So the Sahaba asked him, Ya Rasulullah, why is it that you only eat your food sitting up? He said, because this is more befitting for Nabi and Abda, for a Prophet that will live like a humble slave. So it affected the Prophet ﷺ. That incident actually affected the Prophet ﷺ. Now afterwards, as the Prophet ﷺ starts to experience the end of his life, as it starts to go further and further and further, Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he narrates that the Prophet sallallahu was standing amongst us and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was speaking and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he simply said, إِنَّ اللَّهَ خَيْرَ عَبْدًا بَيْنَ الدُّنْيَا وَبَيْنَ مَا عِنْدَ Allah has given a choice to one of his servants between that which is in this world and that which is with Allah. He said, and that servant chose that which is with Allah. Now the Prophet sallallahu was completely healthy, nothing was wrong with him. 
So the Sahaba assumed what? That this is just some analogy that he's giving. He's just talking about some servant, maybe in the past or something like that. He was given the choice between that of this world and that of the hereafter. But Abu Sa'id says Abu Bakr broke down into tears. And he said, Ajibna li bukai. All of us were shocked by his tears. And in one narration, he even said, Bakayna li bukai. We started to cry because of his crying, not knowing why he was crying. It was just the pain that Abu Bakr showed through his crying affected all of us. So we all started crying because we knew something just happened. And he said, later on, we realized that the Prophet ﷺ was talking about himself. He was the one that was given that choice. And Abu Bakr was the only one who caught it. It was just Abu Bakr that realized that the Prophet ﷺ basically just said that I've been given a choice between this life and the hereafter. From that incident onwards, the health of the Prophet ﷺ started to deteriorate rapidly. The fever got to him and Rasulullah ﷺ started, you know, slowly, slowly his mobility was reduced. He couldn't come out as frequently, couldn't walk, he couldn't stand when he prayed. It started to affect the Prophet ﷺ and it started to get to him. And Rasulullah ﷺ, the last time he prayed with the Sahaba, he prayed how? He, he came out, Abu Bakr was leading the Salah and he led the prayer sitting down even. He led them in prayer sitting down and the companions were excited about that. But what happens at the end? Anas ibn Malik anhu says that we were praying in the masjid and the Prophet وسلم, he, he moved his curtain and when he pulled his curtain, tabassama dahika, he smiled and he laughed. And he says, Kana wajahu waraqatu mushaf said his face was as bright as a page of the Mus'haf. I mean, it was, he was so happy. He laughed and he smiled. At what? At seeing a few hundred people praying. Because he recognized the accomplishment there. That a few hundred people are praying, that they accepted this message and they're praying to their Lord. SubhanAllah, imagine now, <laughs> two billion people, right? The Prophet ﷺ, when he saw that, he was happy, he was pleased that they're praying. I did what I had to do. So Anas said, we looked at the Prophet and we started to get excited in our prayer because we thought he was going to come out. Then the Prophet he signaled to us to keep praying and he drew his curtain closed once again and that was the last time we saw the Prophet Inside of his home, everyone was crying because they knew that the Prophet's time was nearing its end. It was getting, to, it was getting close. Fatima radiallahu anha particularly was deeply devastated. His daughter, Umm Abiha, the mother of her father, subhanAllah, Fatima was with the Prophet ﷺ through it all. And the Prophet ﷺ loved her and adored her. And even though the Prophet ﷺ could barely speak, he called for Fatima with his hand. So Fatima came and the Prophet ﷺ, he told her to come close and he whispered something in her ear and it caused her to cry even more. And the Prophet ﷺ, he told her, come back. And he whispered something else in her ear. And she, she just burst into laughter. <laughs> and Aisha radiallahu anha was watching all of this. She was perplexed by it. Like, why did you cry and then laugh so suddenly? So she kept pushing Fatima. What did he tell you? What did he tell you? What did he tell you? So finally Fatima gave in and she said that the first time he told me that Jibreel usually reviews the Quran with me once in Ramadan. This year he did it twice which means التمكن في الوحي it means solidifying the revelation and so I don't think I'm going to make it past the sickness. The second time the Prophet ﷺ, he said to me that you will be the first one to join me. He just told a young girl, a young lady in her 20s that you're about to die too and you're going to join me too. And Fatima burst out into hysterical laughter because she knows that means being with the Prophet ﷺ, and that was enough for her. That made her happy. If it means being with the Prophet ﷺ, that made her happy. SubhanAllah, it shows you how much of a loving father the Prophet ﷺ was to his daughter. Aisha radiallahu anha then, she was you know, moving the Prophet ﷺ where he needed to be moved. She held the Prophet ﷺ tight and Rasulullah ﷺ was leaning against her chest. And Rasulullah ﷺ, his eyes fell to the side on Abdurrahman ibn Abi Bakr radiallahu anha, anhu, her brother, and he had a siwak in his pocket. And Aisha says the Prophet Sallallahu eyes fell on it and so I knew that he wanted it. So I said to Rasulullah Sallallahu you want that, that toothbrush, the siwak? And the Prophet Sallallahu he nodded his head. So Abdurrahman gave it to her and it still wasn't used. So she chewed it and she softened it and she put it in the mouth of the Prophet Sallallahu Now what's so symbolic about that is that the Prophet Sallallahu he used to brush his teeth before every single prayer because he wanted to have fresh breath when he met Allah five times a day. He said if he could make it mandatory on us, he would. But he, knew, he knows it would be a hardship. So he always brushes his teeth before he meets Allah. 
Aisha says, as soon as he finished using the siwak, دَخَلَ عَلَيْنَا Jibril. Jibril entered upon us. Now, she looked at the Prophet ﷺ and she said the Prophet ﷺ's face lit up. Huge smile on his face. SubhanAllah. He was so happy to see Jibreel. And you know what I think about this? 23 years before this incident, how traumatized was the Prophet ﷺ by the side of Jibreel? And he didn't even know who Allah was or what Allah wanted from him. Iqra bismi rabbika ladhi khalaq. In just 23 years, the most beloved sight to the Prophet ﷺ was seeing Jibreel alayhi salam. And Jibreel alayhi salam said to the Prophet ﷺ, the one who gave him all those advices we talked about, he said to him, look, I'm here to give you a choice. Either you can choose to remain amongst your companions and live well, or you can have the companionship of the Most High, Al-A'la, Allah. Jibreel alayhi salam, when he said that, the Prophet ﷺ responded, Bal al-Rafiq al-A'la, Bal al-Rafiq al-A'la, Allahumma al-Rafiq al-A'la, Oh Allah, the companionship of the Most High. I want the companionship of the Most High. I want the companionship of the Most High. Aisha radiallahu anha, she says that the Prophet ﷺ's soul left his body as he was saying, Al-Rafiq Al-A'la, the Most High, the companionship of the Most High. His hand fell and the Prophet ﷺ died. Aisha radiallahu anha, when that happened, she screamed. And everyone, when they heard the scream of Aisha, they knew that, they knew that the Prophet ﷺ passed away. Fatima radiallahu anha, she was sitting in the hijr, she was sitting in the, the room next door. And when she heard that, she authored some, she said some of the most beautiful words. She knew that she was about to die as well, by the way. And subhanAllah, the prophecy was fulfilled because Fatima got sick four months later and died out of nowhere. Fatima radiallahu anha, when she heard Aisha scream, she looked up and she said, Ya abata, min rabbihi ma adna. Oh my dear father, how close you are now to your Lord. Ya abata, ila Jibreel nan'a. Oh my dear father, to Jibreel we announce your death. Ya abata, jannatul firdawsi ma'wa. Oh my dear father, paradise is now your abode. And she recited it over and over and over again. That how close you are now to Allah. To Jibreel we announce that you've departed. And Jannatul Firdaus is now your place. Now the Prophet ﷺ, he left this world. And SubhanAllah, everyone will leave this world. And the Prophet ﷺ said, even Jibreel will die. Can you imagine that? Even Jibreel alayhi salam will die. The Prophet ﷺ said that, after the horn is blown, and the only ones that stand, إِلَّا مَنْ شَاءَ رَبُّكَ The ones who your Lord willed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will have in front of him, Jibreel, Israfil, Mikal, and the angel of death. المقسمات أمرا Those who apportion the command of Allah, and Allah asks the angel of death, who remains? And the angel of death says, وَجْهُكَ الْبَاقِ الْكَرِيمِ Oh Allah, your noble face, you're here. Abduka, me, Abduka Jibreel, your servant Jibreel, your servant Mikal, and your servant Israfil. Allah says, take the soul of Mikal. And Mikal's soul is taken from him. Then he says, who remains? He said, Ya Allah, you, me, Jibreel, and Israfil. And he says, take the soul of Israfil. And Israfil's soul is taken from him. And he says, who remains? And he says, وَجْهُكَ الْبَاقِ الْكَرِيمِ Your noble face, O Allah. عَبْدُكَ هَذَا This servant of yours. وَعَبْدُكَ جِبْرِيلِ We're the last two standing. Allah says, take the soul of Jibreel. The Prophet ﷺ said, Jibreel would fall on his face as his wings spread out, glorifying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He would die in tasbih, subhanAllah. His face hits the ground as he makes tasbih to Allah. Then, Allah subhan- then he says, who remains? And the angel of death says, Ya Allah, it's just you and me. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the angel of death to die. And the angel of death dies. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Kullu man alayha fan. Every single person perishes. And only the noble face of your Lord remains. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would ask himself, Liman al mulk to whom belongs the dominion today? Where are the oppressors? Where are the dictators? Where are the oppressors? Where are those that used to kill innocent people and harm people? Where are those that istakbaru, that, that had pride in this world and that thought that they owned things and thought that they were kings and thought that they had unquestioned authority? Where are they today? Aina muluk al ard? Where are they? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Liman al mulk al To whom belongs the dominion today? 
Allah says to Himself, لِلَّهِ الْوَاحِدِ الْقَهَارِ To Allah, the one, the subduer. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's only Him. Now on the day of judgment, the Prophet ﷺ says that تَمُدُّ الْأَرْضُ لِعَظُمَةِ الرَّحْمَانِ يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ As we all come back, the Prophet ﷺ says the earth is flattened out of the glory of Allah, in, 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 in obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And He says each and every single person will not be able to move from the spot that they are standing in the place of assembly. And he says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Thumma Uda'a Awalun Nas. And I would be called the first of people. I would be the first person to be called to Allah. And he said, So I would enter upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wa akhirru sajida, and I would fall in prostration. He says, Thumma arfa'u ra'si, and I would raise my head, fa'ida Jibreel an Yameen al Rahman. And suddenly I'll see Jibreel on the right side of the most merciful. So, so and, and you know what he says in this hadith, subhanAllah? He says, Wallahi ma ra'ahu qablaha. I swear by Allah, he never saw him before that day. Jibreel has never seen Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The vision of Allah cannot be grasped. On the day of judgment, that would be the first time Jibreel would actually be able to look at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wallahi ma ra'ahu qablaha. So when the Prophet sees him, he points to him and he says, Ya Rabb, inna hadha akhbarani annaka arsaltahu ilay. He says, Oh my Lord, this one told me that you sent him to me. Allah sadaqt. Allah says, you've told the truth. The same way Jibreel said to the Prophet sadaqt, you've told the truth. Why does the Prophet choose to do that on the Day of Judgment? Why does he feel that inclination? Because on the Day of Judgment, every messenger is being asked whether he delivered the message or not. The Prophet vouches for Jibreel before he's even asked. Oh Allah, he said you sent him to me. He did his job. And Allah says, Sadaqt. Now dear brothers and sisters, what's our relationship with Jibreel right now? You know, one of my favorite things about teaching this class in particular, SubhanAllah, one of my favorite things about talking about Jibreel, as opposed to talking about some of the companions of the Messenger وسلم, is that you can actually interact with Jibreel right now. You know how? You know how? The Prophet وسلم, he says in an authentic hadith, and actually Anas anhu says, and Abu Talha says, one time the Prophet وسلم, all of a sudden his face was just full of joy. So he said to him, Ya Rasulullah, what is it? May Allah keep you happy. He said, Ja'ani Jibreel. Jibreel just came to me. فَقَالْ أَمَا يُرْضِيكَ يَا مُحَمَّدْ أَنْ لَا يُصَلِّي عَلَيْكَ أَحَدْ مِنْ أُمَّتِكْ إِلَّا صَلَّيْتُ عَلَيْهِ عَشْرًا Aren't you pleased though Muhammad وسلم, that no one says Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam except that I send salawat upon them ten times. Jibreel alayhi salam as well. إِنَّ اللَّهَ وَمَلَائِكَتَهُ يُصَلُّونَ عَلَى النَّبِي Allah and the angels send their salawat on the Prophet And when you send the salawat on the Prophet Jibreel alayhi salam responds to you as well. Allah responds to you and Jibreel alayhi salam responds to you. So you want Jibreel alayhi salam to say your name right now? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma salli wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad. What about now? Does he stop coming to the earth now? Is he gone? Do we, does he no, never come down anymore? Actually, the Prophet ﷺ, one time he came out, and this is a hadith narrated in Muawiyah, by Muawiyah anhu. We were just sitting in the masjid and we were talking, and suddenly the Prophet ﷺ came out to us, and the Prophet ﷺ, he said to us, what are you talking about? And they said, Ya Rasulullah, we're just talking about how lucky we are, how blessed we are to be guided to Islam. The Prophet ﷺ said, is that all you were talking about? They said, Ya Rasulullah, all we were talking about is our days of ignorance and how we're blessed to be guided to Islam. The Prophet ﷺ said, don't worry. He said, I just wanted to come to you because Atani Jibreel. Jibreel just came to me. And he said, those companions of yours that are sitting out in the masjid, أَخْبَرَنِي أَنَّ اللَّهَ يُبَاهِي بِكُمُ الْمَلَائِكَةِ Jibreel just came to me and said, Allah is bragging about them to the angels right now. وَإِنَّ اللَّهِ إِذَا حَبَّ عَبْدًا نَادَ جِبْرِيلٌ When Allah loves someone, He calls Jibreel and He says, يَا جِبْرِيلٌ إِنِّي أُحِبُّ فُلَانٌ O oh Jibreel, I love so-and-so. فَأَحِبَّ Love that person as well. فَيُحِبُّهُ جِبْرِيلٌ Jibreel loves you. Jibreel doesn't need to know anything else about you. He just needs to know Allah loves you. And if Allah loves you, that's enough for Jibreel to love you as well. So Jibreel goes and calls all of the angels and the inhabitants of the heavens and says, يَا مَلَائِكَ يَا أَهْلَ السَّمَاء إِنَّ اللَّهَ يُحِبُّ فُلَانَ Allah loves this person, so love him as well. So all of the inhabitants of the heavens love him as well. SubhanAllah. Think about your name being said in this conversation between Allah and Jibreel and Jibreel and the angels. And think about how many likes that is, right? You're talking about trillions 
of angels that love you. They don't just like you, they love you. And Allah places acceptance for that person in the hearts of the people. That's Jibreel alayhi salam. He continues to be amongst the angels that come down to the gatherings that remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we ask Allah that He be amongst us right now. That's the, the, the question I ask myself every time I teach this class. I'm like, how amazing would it be if Jibreel was actually here right now? If Jibreel alayhi salam is actually amongst us reporting our name to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in Ramadan, what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? Tanazzalu al malaikatu wa ruhu fiha. The angels come down and none other than Jibreel is amongst them. This is in the Arabic language, al khas al al-Am, specifying someone amongst them. They came and Jibreel was amongst them. SubhanAllah. So when you're praying taraweeh on that night, or you're reading Quran or doing dhikr, how do you know Jibreel is not the one coming to your house and reporting your name to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? That's something to aim for. That Jibreel comes to my house and reports my name to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on that night of Laylatul Qadr. And we should have that husn al in Allah, that, that good expectation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that that's very possible and that yes, a lowly person like me, Jibreel alayhi salam could be sent to report my name back to my creator subhanahu wa ta'ala. SubhanAllah, even, you know, every time you see al-ruh wal-malaika, al-malaika wal-ruh, the angels, and Jibreel is specified amongst them. You know, even in some cultures, they, there's, there's a special mention of Jibreel alayhi salam just in our everyday language. Some of the Arabic, uh, some, some of the Arabs, whenever they finish the food and there's the dua, Salat alaykum al malaika, may the angels send their prayers upon you. Some of them would say, Illa Jibreel ba'd al shay, <laughs> except for Jibreel after the tea, right? It's like there's this recognition, it's inherent inside of us that Jibreel is greater than the rest of the angels. But you know what? What does Allah tell us? Yawma taqoom al ruhu wal malaika tusaffan. On that day, and Allah puts a ruh this time before the angels, that even a ruh, Jibreel, will be standing in his place, and the angels in their rows, they don't speak unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands them, commands them to speak. They do exactly as they're told. Would we meet Jibreel alayhi salam on the day of judgment? Hudayfa radiallahu anhu narrates an authentic athar that Jibreel is the angel that will be in charge of al mizan, the scales. May Allah make it easy for us on that day, the scales. You would actually see Jibreel alayhi salam on the scales on that day. What about in Jannah? Can you be with Jibreel? Can you actually be with Jibreel telling him about the story of Jibreel and the class that you took? And, and can you talk to Jibreel in Jannah? Can you be with him? Can you? You're with the one that you love. Not only that, the Prophet sallallahu says, رَأَيْتُ Ja'far. I saw Ja'far رضي الله تعالى عنه وَهُوَ يَطِيرُ فِي الْجَنَّةِ مَعَ الْمَلَائِكَةِ And he was flying in Jannah with the angels. You could get your pair of wings and you could fly with Jibreel alayhi salam in Jannah. We know that that exists. We know that that place is there. But I want to end this night, dear brothers and sisters, with something to make it a little bit more personal now. Jibreel is the wali of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam from the angels. Jibreel is his wali. Who is your wali from the angels? It's a powerful question. And what do I mean by that? The Prophet ﷺ said, every night before you go to sleep, an angel comes down to you. And he says, Ikhtim bi khair. Ikhtim bi khair. Ikhtim bi khair. End your night well. End your night well. End your night well. End it with the remembrance of God. End it with an act of charity. End it with a word of kindness. End it with something good. End it with dhikr. End it with wudu. You know? End it with something good, because you might not wake up. End well. The, the angel prompts you, end well. And the Prophet ﷺ said, a shaitan on the other hand says, ikhtim bi shar, end in evil. And the Prophet ﷺ said, if you listen to that angel, ikhtim bi khair, and you end your night well, the angel spends the entire night with you, seeking forgiveness for you, and praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have mercy on you. Until you wake up in the morning, and the angel says, iftah bi khair, iftah bi khair. Iftah bi khair. Start your day off well. Start your day off well. Start your day off well. And the Prophet ﷺ said, if he starts his day off well, the angel spends the entire day with him, seeking forgiveness for him and asking Allah to have mercy on him. That's your wali from the angels. SubhanAllah was just telling Ustad Nu'man what he recited in Salat al Maghrib. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا رَبُّنَ اللَّهِ ثُمَّ اسْتَقَامُوا تَتَنَزَّلُ عَلَيْهِمُ الْمَلَائِكَةِ أَلَّا تَخَافُوا وَلَا تَحْزَنُوا وَأَبْشِرُوا بِالْجَنَّةِ الَّتِي كُنْتُمْ تُوَعَدُونَ نَحْنُ أَوْلِيَاءُكُمْ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ The angels come down to the believer as he's passing away 
the wali, your awliya from the malaika, your guardians, your protectors, the ones who loved you and were with you your entire life from the angels, they come to you just as Jibreel came to the Prophet and they say, don't worry, don't grieve. We were your awliya in this world and in the hereafter as well. Come out to Jannah, Allah has promised it to you. And the Prophet said the believing soul would jump out of this body of joy. It will come out in happiness, subhanAllah. Whereas some people are to the opposite, وَلِعِيَادُ billah. Now I want you to think about that for a moment, dear brothers and sisters, and recognize that the angels are the last thing that we see before we come into this world, and the first thing we see as we're leaving it. In fact, from the tests of this world is that it's the only time in our existence that the angels are concealed from us. Because if we saw them, none of us would act the way that we do. But we choose to surround ourselves in our daily lives with angels, be it Jibreel or other angels, or with shayateen. We make that choice every single moment of our lives, who to surround ourselves with. And subhanAllah, in closing, I just want you, you know, I, I want to share you, with you guys something very, very personal. And subhanAllah, when I say it's very personal, I say that I literally, um, <clears throat> it's, it's, it's actually very hard for me to say this. Do you know Dhiya Yusur Razan, the three young people that were murdered in Chapel Hill? May Allah have mercy on them. Do you know that they were sitting in this class right before they died? Do you know that this was the last class that they took? Here they were sitting, listening to Jibreel, the angels, what it's like when you die, how the angels come to you. And the thought that maybe, just maybe, those same angels came to them and that they're actually experiencing that realm right now. When ahsabuhum min ash-shuhada, we ask Allah that they be granted a shahada. That thought, subhanAllah, really is humbling. And in fact, I actually have, someone actually tweeted to me when they passed away, the Snapchat messages from Yusur, Rahmatullah alayha, talking about the class. And I read that and I couldn't believe what I was reading. And if I had a screen, I would actually show you a picture of that chat. And just seeing it in front of you. And she's telling a cousin of hers that I just took this class. You've got to take it. It was amazing. I never felt so close to Jibreel alayhi salam. And her cousin saying, is it, you know, is it going to be anywhere? And she says, I think they're going to record it for Bayina TV. They're based out of Dallas. She says, you should look them up. And at the end of the text, she says, you should look up Nurman Ali Khan too. <laughs> I read that and I said, that's the one praise that I will actually take. And I'd say, Alhamdulillah. And I hope she's testifying on her behalf right now. I hope, I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that she's testifying on our behalf. And that's the one person, subhanAllah, that, that I wouldn't mind taking that praise from right now. May Allah allow them to testify on our behalf. May Allah allow us to be joined with the malaika, with the angels. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to be in the highest companionship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, with the Messenger وسلم, with the angels, with the Siddiqeen, the Shuhada, with the righteous. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us for our shortcomings and may Allah surround us with the malaika and allow us to end our lives in khair, allow us to end our lives in good. Dear brothers and sisters, Jazakumullah khairan for coming out.